Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome back. We're just coming back from our lunch recess. Welcome, everyone. Tony, let's call the roll. Present. Cohen? Here. Ortiz? Present. Davis? Here. Doan? Present. Candelas? Present. Foley? Here. Atra? Present. Kame? Here. Mahan? Here. You have a quorum. Thank Taurus you. is here. <laughs> oh, sorry, I missed you. <laughs> I didn't have the list open. <laughs> Glad we're all here. All right. Today's invocation will be from the Rainbow Women's Chorus, and Councilmember Davis will tell us more. Thank you. I am looking forward to hearing the Rainbow Women's Chorus today. They have been connecting to people through song since 1996. Uh, these talented, this talented chorus sings to enhance the esteem of all women, celebrate diversity, and promote peace and freedom. That's right in line with why we celebrate pride, which we, we will be proclaiming shortly. So thank you for joining us today. is a Nguni call and response song originally sung by mine workers to express the challenges of working in the mines in South Africa. The word Shoshalosa means go forward. It is used as a term of encouragement and hope for the workers as a sign of solidarity. The sound Shosho is an imitation of the sound made by a steam train. Stimela is the Naguni word for steam train. In contemporary times, it is sung to show support for any struggle. The meaning of the words are, go forward from those mountains on this train from South Africa. Shoshalosa, 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 Thank you so much for that beautiful invocation. Thank you. We are on to ceremonial items. Councilman Cohen, if you join me at the podium, we will recognize the board members and 2023 student winners of the annual Synopsis Science and Technology Championship. Let's have the, uh, the winners who are here and also the members of the board come on down and join us up here in front of the podium.
Yeah. I'm very excited about today's uh, recognition of this group of uh, folks who are here. For 62 years, there's been a county science fair, most recently sponsored by Synopsys. You may not know this, but in March, second Thursday of March every year, at the uh, South Hall of the Convention Center, there's a big science fair with all of the local, many local schools participating, students from grades seven to 12 uh, participating. We know that science and technology is one of the key uh, drivers of our economy here in Silicon Valley, and it's really important to foster the next generation of scientists and engineers. That's what this science fair does. And lest you think that this is simply a, a group of kids making volcanoes or, um, or doing the experiment my child did of seeing whether this five second rule is valid or not when you drop food on the floor, this group of students finds real problems and tries to find real solutions to those problems. I have been serving as a judge at the science fair for the past 15 years and I'm always amazed by the thought put into it, by the technology, by the innovation um, that, and the creativity that students have when they're trying to solve problems related to our environment, to our planet, to astronomy, to health. They, th this amazing research is being done. And as an example, just found out uh, recently that one of the st student winners from the science fair here last year, because as they win here, they move on to other science fairs, California and national science fairs. But last year, uh, this past year, a student from San Jose, uh, Caitlin Wong, was awarded a $75,000 top prize at uh, the National Science Fair sponsored by Regeneron Pharmaceuticals uh, for her research. So there, are, there is amazing work being done here and it's cutting edge research this is, that's being done by students. It starts by the students that join the science fair in seventh grade and then you can see the projects. I, I've been a judge and I'm a, you know, a, a scientist by training and most of the 11th and 12th grade projects, I don't understand what they're talking about. I mean, I, I do my best. Uh, so anyway, I wanted to thank the students. They've all received a certificate. These are the ones who were either honorable mention or first or second prizes at the science fair last year in 2022, actually. We're just now getting around to that, and next year we'll be back with our 2023 winners. But they've all received a certificate signed by the entire council. We also have with us today uh, three members of the uh, board of the Synopsis Science Fair. Uh, Forrest Williams, our former council member, uh, Elena Chaudhuri, and Vina Jane. And um, I think one of them is going to say a few words. Uh, thank you, Council Member Cohen, and also the mayor and all the other council members. Uh, wanted to bring to you the future of, of the city and the entrepreneurial spirit. We're supposed to be the technology, ca technology capital of the world. And this is an example of what is fact going to take care of the future. We're going to leave them a lot of problems, so they're up to the speed in terms of how to solve those problems. So if we listen to them, we can shape the future today. And I just want to uh, extend their experience of a project and let them come to the people who are responsible for them and convey to them that they are, in fact, doing the kind of work that good kids do. And uh, we ask you to support them, continue to lift them up. And if you want to get involved, we have an internet, sciencefair.org. You can go there and look and become supportive members also. Thank you very much. Just one more comment. We're going to present a commendation to the, uh, to the members of the board here in a second. But I also want to mention the, public, the science fair is open to the public at the end of the day on the second Thursday of March. So next year, I encourage all of you on that afternoon after 5 p.m. to go and, and walk around and look at the work that these students are doing because it really is quite impressive.
Have a great rest of the day, students. I'll just echo how proud of you we all are here at the city. Council members Foley, Davis, and Torres, if you would come down to the podium, we will recognize and proclaim June as Pride Month. Good afternoon and happy Pride. All right. Council members Foley and Torres and I are proclaiming Pride Month today. Our LGBTQ plus community deserves all the recognition, praise and celebration they'll be receiving this month because San Jose would not be the same without their contributions. I have two stunning examples of that with me right now. Councilmember Torres and Silicon Valley Pride's Nicole Altamarino are incredibly selfless people and our city certainly would not be the same without them. Inclusion and diversity lead to beautiful collaboration, deep insight, and solutions that meet every community's needs because of a better understanding of each other. With this proclamation, we are affirming that San Jose will always stand with its LGBTQ plus community. You are welcome here and you are appreciated here. Please join us this evening at 5 p.m. at the Rotunda outside at City Hall, where we will be raising the pride and transgender flags as we do every June. We will also have performances by the Silicon Valley Gay Men's Chorus and Folklorico Colibre. Now I'd like to introduce you to Nicole Altamarino. She is the CEO of Silicon Valley Pride. Thank you. Thank you so much, Councilmember Davis, Foley, and Councilmember Torres. Love it. Uh, happy Pride, everyone. Happy Pride. No, louder, louder. Thank you all so much for being here. You know, as we celebrate Pride and Pride Month, you know, we need to remember how Pride began. Pride did not begin out of a need to celebrate, but Pride began out of a need for people to live their authentic self. In the city of San Jose and in the South Bay, we actually celebrate Pride in the month of August. Silicon Valley Pride is the last weekend in August every year, so please make sure you come out. I'm sure we'll be here again. And this year, our theme is Live Out Proud. And as we see sweeping legislation throughout the country, taking back the rights of our trans siblings, specifically our trans siblings of color, we see drag becoming illegal and we see people saying, don't say gay. It is now important more than ever that we stand up and we live out proud. We also in this city and this county and in this state, we are privileged to be here. I am privileged to speak to you. I am privileged to have a mayor and city council that support the LGBTQ plus community. So I implore all of you that are allies, all of you that are part of the community, living out proud is not just showing your beautiful colors, but is also sticking up for those that are more marginalized than you. Because we are only as free as the most marginalized members of our community. So happy Pride. Let's not forget the true and uh, first meeting of Pride. And let's celebrate being beautiful and fabulous like the LGBTQ plus community is known for. Happy Pride, everyone. And don't forget Silicon Valley Pride last weekend in August. Thank you. All right, Councilor Dewan, please join me at the podium and we will recognize the SJPD Mobile Emergency Response Group and Equipment Unit, also known as MERGE. And our officers can come on down.
On February 3rd, 2023, a suspect was stalking our San Jose Police Department officer at a multiple locations. He was pulled over and immediately got out of his, vi out of his vehicle in an ambush-style attack, firing his weapon at two of our patrol officers at Story and King in District 7. Rounds went through the windshields and into the driver headrest of the police vehicle. One of those officers is here today, and his name is Officer Joseph Valverde. The suspect fled the scene to a nearby residence, and later that night opened fire on officer again, discharging multiple rounds, striking two SJPD merge officer. Those officers are here today. Merge officer Colin Bryan and Juan Cuellar, both of which have exemplary career and are held in the highest regard of their peers and commanding officer. Merge officer Colin Bryan was shot in his ballistic plate, which saved his life. Merge officer Cuella was shot in the leg, and he applied his own tourniquet while waiting for help. He required surgery immediately afterwards. Even though the suspect appeared to be on a mission to kill police officers, he was taken into custody alive without a single shot being made by our merge unit. Their high level training, intrepidness in the most peril of circumstances, and devotion to saving human lives are indicative qualities of the best police department in our nation. These officers were almost killed that night in the line of duty serving our city and our community. They, along with their families and loved ones, nearly pay the ultimate price. We are recognizing these officers for their, and the entire merge unit for their valor, honor, and commitment. Additionally, we are lighting the City Hall in Officer True Blue from June 17th to June 24th in honor of all San Jose Police Department officers, especially Merge Officer Quaylar and Brian. I ask that you please join me in thanking them all for their service to our city. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council Member, uh, and also thank you uh, for Council Member uh, Ben Duan for uh, your recognition of these officers. Um, I'm extremely proud of our men and women who go out, out there every day and display the uh, courage and bravery that they do, keeping our community safe. That night, uh, we have our officers, one, one officer who's no longer with us, Officer Lopez, but Officer Villanueva, uh, Cuellar, and Colin Bryan. Uh, as the council member mentioned, um, almost lost their lives, uh, taken into custody and responding to a, a dangerous individual. But because of their, their training, their heroics, their extreme bravery and courage, they were able to uh, survive that attack and keep our community safe and take the individual into custody. So with that, uh, I want to thank uh, each and every one of the officers here today uh, for their um, work with the merge unit and keeping our community safe. So thank you again, council member.
Okay, thank you colleagues. That completes our ceremonial items. We are now going to resume public comment for item 8.4, has to do with the recreational vehicles, community support parking, and emergency interim housing proposed sites. I'll turn it over to Tony. And this also includes 8.5. I'm sorry, you're right. We are hearing them concurrently. We yes. will vote on them separately. Right. Um, so the first person I have is Julie, followed by David. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Um, so the first thing I wanted to say was I support the sites in Cerrone and Cherry Avenue, and I hope they go forward. Um, the second thing was Looking at one of the slides that they shared earlier with the completed in design and total or TBD sites, it's very concerning because I'm a resident at 85 and 101, and we don't see it as District 2 or District 10. We see it as our neighborhood. And there are a lot of these sites which we've previously fought against last year and are now apparently fighting against again that are all within a mile or less. And I know we've shared these maps over and over with the council, but I would like to see something in the future where there's some sort of restriction on how many sites can be placed in one neighborhood or the number of beds or something, because this is a yearly battle for residents and it's very stressful and we're concerned about the future of our neighborhood. So I would like to put it on the council and the mayor to propose something to protect our neighborhood and even oversaturation of other neighborhoods, they don't face the same issue. And one more comment, um, our new District 10 council member, I would like you to be more proactive in these battles for your neighborhood. And I would also like you to be more responsive to your residents as well, because I have not heard back from you once yet. Um, but that's it and thank you for listening. David, followed by caller 4547. Honorable Mayor and City Council, I'm David Noel, President of Erickson Neighborhood Association, which represents 650 homes adjacent to the Cherry Avenue Emergency Interim Housing Site. I encourage you to approve this site along with its Water Resources Protection Zone. I'd like to thank Councilmember Foley, Jennifer Codayan of Valley Water and Omar Passons from uh, the city manager's office for bringing forward this ingenious practical solution to a huge problem plaguing our neighborhood, local businesses, and the environment. While not all neighborhood, while not all neighbors support the proposed EIH, I feel most are generally supportive if the water resources protection zone is enforced and the site has responsive 24 hour management. Our residents look forward to feeling safe, enjoying the natural beauty of the Guadalupe River and percolation pond areas again, and ending the fires explosions, blight, screaming, crime, graffiti, and environmental destruction that have been eroding our safety and quality of life. Our neighborhood association stands ready to participate in a community advisory committee to ensure this EIH site is the best it can be. Thank you. Caller 4547 four, followed by Juvenile and Lucy. Go ahead, caller. You're unmuted, but we can't hear you. Hello, can you hear me now? Yes. Hello, yes. Uh, my name is Sayed Rahman. I'm uh, a resident of uh, the Berryessa neighborhood, and obviously a bit uh, opposed to the uh, plants in you know, the RV parking area. We've been um, working on getting the, uh, the homeless off the creek for the last few years. There have been numerous fires and, and you name it, uh, people with machetes walking on the streets. So um, obviously it's a safety concern. And also uh, we've seen what an RV camp looks like. Um, you know, the example from the airport area, uh, how a totally uncontrolled, um, you know, parking space can degrade into, uh, you know, a crime infested area. Basically they were recovering a lot of theft or, or items that were that were stolen from the neighborhoods, including cars in that in that area. So obviously there is a, an example to look back and predict what can happen. And this is in total contrast to 
the planned uh, development of the flea market area, both uh, high-end um, you know, office buildings and so on and so forth. So it looks like we take one step forward to developing the area and one step backwards. And we, I heard a lot about you know, the, uh, oh, the, 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 um, the homeless uh, need to be accommodated, but what about us taxpayers, residents of the neighborhood? We have concerns, and I have a feeling, over the, given our experience over the last couple of years, that the council is not treating this uh, as seriously as we would like. And so, you know, there's, there's, uh, these things are being passed without adequate uh, information. And obviously, these meetings are on the weekdays where most people are working. I know in my neighborhood, uh, nearly 100% are opposed to this. Um, and that basically should be taken into consideration. I think the, it does not. Um, Juvenal and Lucy, followed by Danya. Juvenal? Could you hear me? Yes. Okay. Good afternoon, Mayor and members of the Council. First, I want to thank Council Member Jimenez for all he does for our district, as well as Omar and Jackie for their, and their entire team for all their efforts and accomplishments to date to help our homeless residents. Regarding the two Brunel and Highway 101 backup sites, these sites are not ideal locations for many reasons, but from my opinion, first and foremost, for the safety reasons. There is very heavy traffic being exits and entries for Highway 101. And I'm afraid and we're afraid that this is gonna create major safety issues for both the residents that will reside in these sites and also for the driving public and for our neighborhood. Therefore, we're against this recommendation. Thank you. Danya, followed by Blair. Hi, everyone. Uh, hi to the Honorable Mayor and all the council members. I am a D2 resident. I live on the Great Oaks Parkway. Thank you for Council Member Ines to voice his opposition to the upcoming EIHS in our area. Uh, if you look at the graph, it shows that only one to 2% of the homeless population used to live in this area. But I am wondering why the city is trying to push 947 beds in this area. Like multiple EIH projects are coming up. Uh, there are two safe parking projects that are coming up in our area. And we already have like two EIH. I know that the EIHs inside are very well managed, but the, the concern is majorly because of how it's maintained outside. There are encampments right opposite the current EIH and nothing much is done about it. And even when EIHs are built, there is no guarantee for the residents that it will improve their uh, quality of life, especially in the vicinity of, of an EIH. There is no buffer, there is no enhanced services or outreach or nothing. So what you get is like multiple EIHs, they are just temporary solutions. After a few months, people exit. And if you look at the data that the deputy manager uh, presented, it doesn't look like even it has 50% success rate. It's somewhere close to 35%. So many of them unfortunately go back to homelessness. Uh, yeah, so that's our major concern. So if EIHs, the current EIHs, if you can manage well, I don't think there'll be much pushback for more EIHs from coming. Yeah, that's all I have to say. Thank you. Blair, followed by Randy. Hi, uh, Blair Beekman here. Thanks a lot uh, for this item. I mean, a real thanks a lot. Um, the fact that it, it's been able to make council after a pretty grim April and May, we weren't really talking about these things. Uh, thank you. And you're talking about it really well. Um, I'm interested in how, um, also interested in a public comment today from, you know, concerned residents who are tired of, of the process of having to have, you know, these sort of questions in their neighborhoods. Um, 
you know, I, I, I'm hoping that we're entering a new level of how to have this conversation uh, for all sides and to be negotiable and understandable about uh, the practices. And it's just been interesting to hear public comment, but I hope a new uh, language is developing, uh, how we connect with each other and be open and honest with each other, what is, why the, the needs for government-sponsored encampments can be really important and helpful. And for certain neighborhoods to want to be a part of that or to help map out where could be good future neighborhoods in the future so that people aren't surprised so much. I mean, good luck in those sort of pre pre preparation efforts and working together in the future. Um, and, I, and I guess just uh, with my remaining time, just to uh, thank you um, on, the, on the previous item before this one, I was clarified by uh, the mayor. Uh, my public comment was off a bit and uh, sorry about that. <laughs> so good to know it was a really good, uh, item and I can talk about that at public comment open forum at the end of the meeting. Otherwise, uh, yeah, good luck on real community dialogue and, and really building and uh, creating good community dialogue this kind of issue in the future. Thank you. Randy, followed by Elvera. Great. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Um, Randy Enos, I'm uh, part of the Basking Ridge community and, and uh, Councilman's uh, I'm in District 2, and um, we need, as somebody may have spoken up before, I, I've stated a lot of these concerns, and I actually put them in writing into an email to you guys with some photos of, um, you know, the encampments right next to the Rue Ferrari site. When that site was built, we talked last year or a year and a half ago, there was promises made that this would not happen. And so now what we're saying, so I, so I just don't support the backup sites at 101 and Bernal um, because we already have a hundred, over 100, like 118 units at Roof Ferrari. That's going to be expanded as it is. And I just feel like we're getting our unfair share and carrying a lot of the burden. I'm seeing a lot more homeless um, in our neighborhood. I walk the neighborhood quite a bit and, and there's people wandering our neighborhood. Um, so it's attracting more unhoused folks to the area. And there's a, you know, a elementary school in our neighborhood. It's creating, you know, safety issues there. Um, you know, I, I, it's just a lot of the same concerns that were voiced, safety concerns for not only the unhoused, but for drivers. Um, you know, it really is... As someone said, it's almost like these things are just, you know, they, I, I appreciate being you know, here, but, it, you know, having to wait three hours to deliver a comment is really, you know, somewhat challenging. And I would say is please um, consider other sites rather than having even more sites here. Elvera followed by Travis. Hi, thank you everyone. My name is Elvera Faria. I'm a District 2 resident and community leader. District 2 has been a leader of providing EIH housing, safe parking, overnight warming centers, senior housing, and bridge housing. Mr. Jimenez has led the way despite constant pushback from the community. Therefore, I'm asking that you all support his memo today. In addition to the housing department in Omar, we requested last night that the presentation be corrected to reflect the correct numbers, and it doesn't look like it was updated. Monterey and Branham, 204 units is District 2, not District 3. Berryessa Road, 85 units is District 4, not District 3. This is almost 300 units mislabeled throughout your presentation as District 3. In addition, we all know after redistricting, you change the name of the district, but the units are still concentrated in the same location. This does not help the conversation about equity listed on your site because the distribution is all in the same location within a one mile radius. This is unfair to the surrounding community and for our first responders who visit these sites daily, if not multiple times a day. Firehouse 27 is overwhelmed. It seems also that your backup sites are potential sites waiting for funding to count towards your 2000 unit goal. 
you are counting on the backup sites getting approved. And then when you get approval to receive your funding from Measure E, you will already have them available to use. District 2 and District 10 residents are asking the city for equitable distribution. Thank you. Travis, followed by Ann. Travis Murphy. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. I'd like the mayor and council to please keep in mind equity rather than solely expediency when picking places to build sites in our city. I live nearby where the 8511 meet, and there already exists Monterey Branham, Monterey Bernal, the soon to be expanded roof Ferrari sites, as well as the soon opening Santa Teresa State parking area. This is all within a walk of our homes. I share sentiments with many of my neighbors that believe we have already done more than our fair share of, to burden the sh uh, city's homeless aid sites. And yet, despite how many sites there already are around our neighborhoods, I'm shocked and dismayed to see city hopes to add even more. Between Villa de Oro, Colorado Road, 85 Great Oaks, 85 Santa Teresa, both Bertle and 101 sites, it looks like our area will likely double its burden in the coming years. Meanwhile, areas like Evergreen, Alvedon, Cambrian, and the entireties of Districts 1 and 4 continue to seemingly do nothing to help tackle homelessness crisis in our city. If San Jose wants to solve this crisis, it's going to take the entire city to pitch in, not just particular areas. It's time for other parts of the city to step up to the plate and help solve it. Otherwise, as it stands, South San Jose is dangerously coming close to becoming the city's glorified dumping grounds, where it ships off its problems that other areas, particularly wealthy ones, don't want to see nor deal with. I ask the mayor and council, please take the time to find solutions that are fair for everyone in San Jose, rather than what's quick and easy. Our neighborhoods, livelihoods, and children deserve to be safe just as much as everyone else's. Thank you for your time. And followed by Sam. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Ah, thank you for uh, letting me have a voice here today. Um, the permanent housing success rate from the city assistance is very good, but what, what happens to the remainder third of these people, the, the ones that go back to homelessness and you know we don't know about? Um, I've seen an increase of encampments and blight here in South San Jose, where the majority of tiny homes, as well as a site that will soon have about 67 RVs and cars here. Our area is saturated and more property here is being proposed as alternative backup sites. We are saturated and alternative backup sites must be found in other districts, not here. And that's it, thank you. Sam, followed by Benjamin Wang. Hello, hi, can you guys hear me? Yes. Hi, I'm here to, uh, yeah, so uh, thank you everyone. Um, so I'm here to oppose the uh, idea to uh, build the um, RV parking site for homeless community in uh, Berryasa. Because this is, because the, um, the city has been saying this is an industrial area, but this is not. It's right across from like a huge, like um, heavily dense um, residential area, including hundreds of like townhomes, single homes and a huge um, apartment complex. On top of that, they are, um, there's a plan to build like another 850 homes in the same area. So this is like a very heavily dense area, uh, residential area already. And a lot of families with uh, young children, um, you know, like they spend a lot of time in the area, you know, um, so it's just not safe for um, the kids or next generation. And there's also like a plan to build a park there. So again, the children will spend like more time there and then it's just not safe for them to even have like a, a childhood, um, you know, being like uh, uh, safely to play outside. So the location is the key. So this location is just like too, too cl um, close to um, a heavy, heavily dense, residential area. So I um, urge the city council members to please reconsider this location 
um, to maybe pick a location further away from um, the neighborhood. Thank you very much. Okay, I have Benjamin here in person and then I'll go back to Isaac on Zoom. Hello, my name is Dr. Benjamin Wang. I live in the Berryessa um, area. I've lived there for over 20 years continuously. Um, I grew up there. And this is my son, Grayson Wang. He is a new resident of San Jose. He is four months old. Um, we deeply oppose the RV uh, recreational site because we don't believe the community is getting safer and we don't believe that this um, proposal to concentrate more of um, transitional housing um, in this area will help our community. Um, quite frankly, um, this community already has a tiny home transitional housing site and, and many low-income housing um, complexes, including senior housing and a um, community homeless shelter that helps homeless people um, get back on their feet already. Um, putting basically the largest RV transitional housing site and concentrating it in this one area affects me and my family and also my neighbors. Um, so I urge the council to reconsider this proposal and to think about um, what it means to working families such as my own. Thank you very much. Isaac followed by Kath Katerina. Yeah, hi, uh, uh, this is Isaac. I just want to, uh, I'm, I'm calling in regards to the uh, EIH in South, South San Jose. So I would like to urge the, uh, the city council to reconsider uh, bringing more uh, EIH to, the, to our area. And just, uh, it's just unfair. So that's all I'm going to say. Please, uh, please uh, we, we, all we're asking for is for fair distribution. Thank you. Katerina? Hello, Mayor Mahan and the rest of the council members. My name is Katerina Wong and I've lived in the Barry Essen neighborhood for about 10 years or so. Um, I would like you to not pursue the 1300 Barry Essen Road Safe RV Park because of the following reasons. The first one is because you're basically just moving blight to another concentrated area of blight. You're not solving the problem because that area that you plan to move the RVs to is a flood zone. I don't know if any of you are aware of that. Um, and it's nestled in between these um, industrial plants, granite rock and the recycling schnitzer recycling plant. Um, it's not a very good area for people to have more room and kind of get back on their feet. Um, I urge you to think of more permanent solutions. Maybe rent out some of the existing um, empty buildings in the neighborhood and um, use that money more wisely. Because uh, what happened was that land was sold um, for $23 million. And now the city is planning to lease it back for $18.9 million, right? So I don't think that's a very wise use of the city's funds. Okay, so I guess in summary, just really reconsider and think about longer term solutions. And they're just like planting these poor people, unhoused individuals into something that's not gonna work. Thank you. Thomas followed by Justin. Yes, thank you. My name is Thomas Knight, um, Mayor and City Council members. I um, want to voice my support for the safe parking and interim housing sites. Uh, these are crucial initiatives in addressing the homelessness issue in our city. Um, however, my support comes with a strong caveat that these initiatives should not be supported by any reallocation of Measure E funds. Uh, furthermore, I object to the creation of no parking zones. Such zones exclude uh, are these some of these projects exclude um, participants such as the safe parking um, doing due to uh, restrictions that those individuals may have um, and uh, 
you know, they push these residents further into the periphery. Uh, this is counter to the housing first model, which stands for providing stable housing without preconditions or barriers. Uh, let's reassess the impl implications of no parking zones and strive to ensure everyone, regardless of their circumstances, has access to safe, accessible options while we work towards providing more permanent solutions. Together, I believe we can ensure the principles of inclusivity and compassion uh, and uphold the uh, standards of the city of San Jose. Thank you very much. Justin. Uh, hello, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, yes, hi. Um, I'm also one of the residents um, from around the District 2, District 10 areas. Um, I've been following this um, very closely. I work around, I visit other neighborhoods as you know, part of my job. And without getting to specifics, I definitely see that there are other areas that could be chipping in to help out with this crisis. I, I like other people have voiced that over-concentration here is very concerning. And to be honest, I, I recognize we've gone through all these meetings and it sounds like no matter what, I think our voices don't feel like they're heard or considered and looks like you will, you will pr proceed with what is in the best interest of the city. With that being said, if, if, that's, if that's the direction, then I, I really would appreciate it if you guys could consider our districts and add some protections to our streets, increase policing resources to this area, help keep our streets clean. Um, I think that'd be great as taxpayers I feel like we contribute a lot already and you know we just ask that we get our neighborhoods cleaned up as well in the process instead of just continuing to add to the blight safety like every other neighborhood is a concern i'm not asking to mess up any other people's neighborhoods but to simply distribute in an equitable way thank you back to the council Thank you. And just before we jump into the council discussion and deliberation, I want to start by thanking staff. Thank you, Omar, uh, Jim, Ort Paul, Matt Lesh, uh, Kevin Ice, Jackie Morales Peran, Reagan Henninger, and all the many other staff members who have done what is, you know, frankly, thankless, difficult, uh, but really in incredibly important work to help us find a pathway to addressing unsheltered homelessness in our community. As you saw in the presentation, we do have safe managed interim or, or temporary or transitional placements for just under 2,000 people, but we have another 4,000 who are living in unsheltered, unmanaged environments. And, and the truth is, and I think it sometimes gets missed in these conversations, that there is also a cost to inaction. And that when we do not move forward solutions and find and create new safe managed spaces with services that can help people turn their lives around, we are making a decision, even if it doesn't feel like we're making an affirmative decision, we are in fact making a decision to leave folks out on our streets in tents and vehicles already in our neighborhoods, already along our trails and parks and creeks and commercial districts and our unhoused communities there. Those folks are, are already there. And so to me, is, as complex as we want to make this, uh, the, the, when you really boil it down, it's a question of are we going to continue to advance safe managed alternatives to the status quo, to the unsheltered encampments and the unmanaged RVs that frankly are the biggest source of constituent complaints and calls that uh, most of us, if not all of us, get every day. Um, I do want to thank Councilor Jimenez and Council Members Davis Torres and Duan, uh, in particular for representing districts that have taken on the lion's share of the solution. And they are solutions. The good news here, and there's no there's no absence of cost or absence of trade-offs. There's no free lunch, as economists say. But the good news is what we have seen with interim placements is when we get somebody into a stable environment where they have their own private space, where they have privacy and stability, and they have access to services, it generally works. 
for a very high need population that once again, I'll just remind everybody, is already out in the neighborhoods. 70% of the folks who have entered one of our interim sites remains housed. 50% have graduated to permanent housing. So, and on top of that actually, let me just add, when we looked at the data on calls for service for 12 months after a site opened in that vicinity, and compared it to 12 months before, we actually saw a reduction in calls for crime and for blight, which actually makes a lot of sense because we're getting people out of unmanaged, unsafe, unsheltered conditions into a managed environment with security, with services, with some structure, with the opportunity to turn their lives around. As was also noted, Council has repeatedly, consistently given direction around the need to scale up these kinds of safe managed placements as an alternative to the crisis on our streets. We have 493 EIH beds operating today, 204 under construction, and a few hundred more in the pipeline. We're also fortunate to have a governor who recognizes the need and the success of these interim solutions and is willing to contribute 200 units. We've also had some incredible philanthropists like John and Sue Sobrato and um, Peter and Susanna Powell who have personally contributed to help reduce the cost to taxpayers of scaling up these solutions. So um, I understand, I fully recognize that every time we move forward a solution, there are folks who will oppose it. That is inevitable. What I will also tell you though, having now been on the receiving end of a number of very angry uh, meetings about these kinds of sites is that I've actually had a number of people, I've been surprised at how many people have come up to me a year or two later and said I was dead set against it, the council implemented it, and I don't even know it's there. And actually, I think you were right part of the solution. It's not the whole solution, but it's better than the alternative. So I just, it, it's not easy. It takes time. I think we all agree that to the extent possible, we want to spread these out as much as we possibly can. But the truth is, we're very, very constrained in where there are places to provide these kinds of alternatives. We've leased motels. We've, as you saw from the map, got a lot of little bubbles all over the city. They're not perfectly distributed. I wish they could be, but the garbage dump isn't perfectly distributed. The location of the jail isn't perfectly distributed. The reality is solving these problems is a societal imperative and we can't always perfectly distribute them or mitigate any and all impacts. I will say to one of the public speakers, then I'll turn to my colleagues, I do believe, and I've repeated this multiple times, and we'll discuss this through the budget. My message will be coming out tomorrow, and Councilor Jimenez put forward a, a budget document that I really appreciate. I do believe we have a responsibility to be extremely proactive in ensuring that neighborhoods that take on these solutions are made better, not worse off. And while the data generally indicates that that is the case, because again, we're moving people out of unmanaged environments to managed environments, I think that it is incumbent upon us in the months and years ahead, and including through this budget process in the coming week, to continue to make investments to proactively demonstrate to neighborhoods that they will be made better, not worse off, by taking on these solutions. So is it a perfect solution? No. Is it a meaningful step forward to approve these sites and keep scaling up interim safe managed alternatives to encampments and RVs? Absolutely. And while 99.9% .9 of our residents are out at work right now going about their days or at school, I can tell you from having knocked on 12,000 doors, their number one goal is that we identify solutions to unmanaged encampments and RVs. So we have an opportunity to meaningfully move the ball forward on those solutions today. Thanks again to staff for bringing these sites forward. Thanks to everybody who worked on memos. And with that, I am going to go to Council Member Cohen. I'm going to, oh, okay. I didn't expect to be first on the list. Um, I'm going to ask some questions. We're taking these two items separately, is my understanding, though, right? We are discussing them concurrently. We will vote on them separately. Okay. Can I hear some other folks first, then talk we can, a little We later, can certainly come back point. around yeah. to you. Okay. I have Councilor Torres next. All right. 
Great. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you so much for uh, for this presentation, uh, and um, you know, uh, thank you to to uh, Mayor Mayhem for for actually thanking uh, council members or districts who who have uh, who have given who have come up with their fair share of um, affordable housing projects, emergency uh, housing, um, you name it, shelter beds. Uh, I have a I have a couple questions. Uh, be, before I before I finish my comments, I've I've noticed in the presentations that we do not uh, include Casitas de Esperanza, which is in Japantown, on the list. Why why is that? The so the the units are from the federal uh, housing inventory count that's published uh, close of 2021. I, I believe that those units are actually incorporated. Um, for, for those. That project is not a city funded. Jackie, do you want to speak to that one specifically? <clears throat> Correct. So I, I'm not sure which list, but if uh, there was a list that detailed all the city funded ones, but you're right. There that. is Casa Esperanza is a um, interim housing site that is 100% yeah. funded by the county. Right. Okay, good. Uh, that, was the, that was the question. Cause, uh, and I, I'm, I'm asking that question because uh, with the whole debate about this RV parking and uh, EI8 sites, right? I got a bunch of emails saying that, you know, District 3 hasn't been, you know, providing their fair share of um, emergency housing. Uh, and so I wanted to include that in my statements that we also have Casita de Esperanza. So District 3 has three EIHs in, um, in our city, right? Providing for our unhoused with Spartan Keys and other neighborhoods providing countless of permanent supportive housing for, 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 for our families and our unhoused residents. Um, so um, I had another question and I didn't write it down, so I forgot. So, uh, but, but with that, if it comes around, I'll, I'll, do, it, I'll, I'll do something again, so thank Okay, you. sounds good. Uh, let's go, is, is there a reason that we wouldn't, in, in the interim units, count all the interim units in the city irrespective of who funded it? Yeah, I think the distinction that's being drawn, if we could pull up that map, slide eight, I think the distinction is being drawn is that there's a larger map that, that represents everything that's within the municipal boundaries of the city of San Jose that's emergency transitional. That's this slide that's up right now. And you can see, including anything built by the end of 2021 when the report was taken, I think what the council member Torres was referring to was actually a different slide in here that doesn't include that because we didn't fund it. So we were so the casitas you. are in fact on the map. Right, right, right. Yes. So on the bubbles on the map, the, there it the, is comprehensive. Yes. yes. In the count on the subsequent slide, they are missing. Yes, and I see. and in other presentations, and excuse me, I know I, I yielded my time, but uh, in other presentations, casitas de esperanza has, has been also left off the list as well, as uh, since it's a tiny home project. Well run by, you know, our, um, I believe it's uh, Amigos de Guadalupe who runs Casitas, so good, good job to them, kudos to them, and kudos to our Japantown residents who have an advisory committee. So uh, if, for, those of you, for, for those residents who, who are skeptical of safe parking and skeptical of emergency housing, uh, in District 3, we've created advisory uh, councils where we bring all the residents together and we meet monthly regarding these tiny home projects. So uh, I'm just throwing it out there for, for folks who are skeptical of all these projects. Yeah, yes, and, and so I would like clarification because we've gone back and forth on this. When the city's counting towards its goal of trying to achieve X number of interim housing sites in the city, is it the council's direction that we're only counting city funded uh, units or is yes. it a broader? So let me explain okay. the, the distinction. There's a difference between us setting a goal around projects and initiatives that we are funding and dedicating staff time to and growth goals that we're setting for ourselves. That to me is the thousand new placements that was part of council direction in March as we've discussed. When it comes to helping the community understand the distributions of solutions to homelessness and the perception of concentration, the perceptions of negative impact, the belief that only one neighborhood is taking on all of the solutions to homelessness, I think the fairest, most accurate way to do that is to take our, all the land within our city boundaries, to consistently clarify the levels of housing. What I think is shown here is what we would call shelter. It's transitional, it's interim, it's not meant to be a permanent housing solution. We are 
differentiating that from other solutions, such as permanent supportive housing, affordable housing, market rate housing, mental health hospitals, the jail, all the other places people end up. And we were specifically saying when it comes to transitional or, or interim shelter in our community, here is the true distribution of it. Because frankly, to say it's all concentrated in one area is not accurate. And in fact, I would argue the newer sites that we have built with private rooms, with bathrooms, with 24-7 security, with on-site services are frankly a better alternative that's getting better outcomes than the congregate shelter that you see as the very large bubble in District 7. So I would actually argue that some of the newer solutions we're bringing forward, continuing to add some bubbles to the map, are actually getting better outcomes and have been even more effective than some of the legacy ones that you, that you do see here. Great, then the staff presentation that is accurate per council Perfect. direction in where we're placing the sites. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Yes, and, and, yeah, and that, I, that is correct. And, and I would add that, that other, the next slide, the bar slide, was kind of giving you an indication of the amount of capacity we have to deliver as a staff. To deliver on city. our goals as That's a city. Correct. correct. That's correct. So Jackie's yeah. right. They're, they're both, they're, I think, they're different based upon yeah. your description, Mayor. Great. Great. Perfect. Great. And, and one, of the, one of the public. That's two slides forward. Oh, yeah. yeah. And one but of I the think from the purposes of distribution, one more slide. There. This is our city pipeline. Yes. And that's accurate. And the, but there's one of the public commenters also said so there is a typo. Uh, Monterey and Branham aren't, is not in District Three. That's in District Two. It's a little bit too too far My south. My apologies, Council Member. That is correct. That is yeah. the that typo is not connected to any of the other calculations in any of the presentation. It's just a missed key in one place. My apologies. You really picked the right one to have a typo on, Omar. It was formerly District Ten, but yes, that is District Two. Okay. Uh, apologies. Let me get back to our. Council list here, Councilor Torres spoke. We're on to Councilor Foley. Great, thank you for the staff presentation and I'm, I'm really proud with the engagement we've had in District 9 over the Cherry Avenue uh, proposed emergency interim housing. I wanna thank the partnership with Valley Water for the potential use of their property and the negotiations that is uh, hopefully going to make all of this happen. It, it's for a long time uh, in District 9, I've been concerned that we haven't had a EIH site or a tiny home site, whatever you wanna call it, interim housing site, because we don't have a lot of land. Uh, and, and in fact, this isn't even our land, this is Valley Waters land and with their cooperation, we're able to work out the negotiations and house up to uh, 100 units, which is fabulous. We did a lot of public engagement with the District 9 community, and I want to thank Dave Noel, who spoke, who called in earlier, who's the president of the Erickson Neighborhood Association, and also the neighbors for a very thoughtful discussion of what the EIH could look like, what it will mean to the community, and how that will be betterment for the unhoused who live in that area, and also uh, better for the resident, the neighbors uh, as well. So I'm really excited to be able to bring forth finally an EIH in District 9. We did a lot of outreach to not just the residents and we extended our mailings to beyond where we normally do the mailings, but we also hand delivered invitations to the businesses that surround that area too. The businesses we didn't hear from very much, uh, but we will continue to engage them and we look forward to the opportunity to create a community advisory committee when the EIH is up and running. So. Uh, I have a motion to make, um, and then I have a few questions. The, I would like to move uh, my memo that I uh, co-authored with mayor, the mayor, vice mayor, council, and council member Cohen. I'd like to move uh, council member Batra's memo, but modify item 1B to change the language from present it to council approval to pursue to instead present it to council for discussion, because really that just, that investigates the, op, the possibility of using that site and what that, or the, the mile radius, uh, uh, mile radius and what that means. So I'd like to bring that back to council. I'd also like to move council member Jimenez's menu, memo 
And I'd like to add a couple of items to my memo, which is to prioritize Cherry, Cerrone, and then Rue Ferrari, and to return to council in 2024 to discuss future EIH site. And with that, I so move a pretty complicated memo. <laughs> That was complex. <laughs> Council member, just to be clear, I think there may be a conflict between one of the items in the group memo and Councilor Jimenez's memo. Can you just clarify how you're reconciling those? Where, where's the conflict? I didn't, I didn't see one. I'm, I'm effectively removing the uh, two Bernal sites for, for current uh, consideration. Right, which the group through memo. The, through the Jimenez memo. Right, which the group memo just simply, so, there, so that would override the note in the group memo, just to be clear. Yeah, the, the group yeah, memo item direction five says do says not pursue Bernal, Bernal Road South Sites until the options have been exhausted. That effectively says remove those sites and yeah, if you, exactly. Let's remove from number five because that does, is, does offer a little bit of confusion. Yeah, I read number five as saying we would pursue the other sites first, but leave, those, leave it as a backup. Yeah, and I'm. So uh, you want to strike rec five, just yes. to be clear, because yeah. those are in conflict. Right. Okay. Let's go. I have a few questions first. Yeah, please. Yeah, I still have. Um, so thank you. Uh, I truly appreciate all of the engagement that you've done on all of these sites, and I know we have a lot of work to do on Cerrone still, and hopefully that will be successful, but that too is a site that we don't control, that we have to work with VTA, and hopefully those of us who sit on the VTA board will be able to work with VTA and try to get some movement on those sites as well. Regarding the District 9 site, and actually uh, any of these sites in particular, can you tell me what specific services are, will be provided at these sites? Sure, so the services that we typically provide on the sites are we provide um, case management. So um, we work with each individual to identify what are their specific needs and the whole idea of case management on these sites is really to match up those services uh, with those particular needs and so it, it could vary depending upon the individual because each individual in, each individual is evaluated to identify what their specific requirements are jackie could you go into a little bit more detail with us on that what does what kind of services might case management offer and be available to a resident? Sure. So from the very beginning, it's just um, looking at some of the income requirements. And so have you signed up for food stamps and all the other benefits that you might um, be eligible for so that you have an income? Um, secondly, how, what are your health concerns? Um, and identifying if you're connected to any kind of health care service would be another one. Food, what, do you have nutritious food? Um, do you know how to cook what you need to be able to have access to? Because there are shared cooking facilities in, in the, the place. Clothing, uh, kids, if they're in, and most of these sites don't, but I am thinking of the Evans Lane where we have kids and what their specific needs are. Transportation, how do you get to the site from places that you need to get to? And then of course, the housing piece. So what are you thinking about in terms of housing? Do you have a relative? Do you have friends? Um, are you looking for shared housing? Do you qualify and have you been evaluated for the whole continuum of care and the services of housing that we may provide, which is permanent supportive housing or rapid rehousing, which are rental subsidies as well. Thank so you. So it's really a full gamut of trying to figure out what the, what the person is eligible for and then if they need any additional services, substance abuse, uh, mental health, and of course, for those who are really dependent upon the public um, health care system for that, and that I would say can be challenging because when people are, re are ready, you want to have a slot ready, and that's not always available. Thank you. That, that is really helpful for you to go through that list for us and for the community to see what kind of wraparound services you're talking about in 
these units and not that we're dropping them there and that's the end of that. And so that they, we understand all of the different services available. Can you tell me when it comes to counseling and case management, what kind of hours of operation they would have on the site? In general, you may not be able to specifically say yet, but for like Cherry, but in general, what, what are we seeing? Like Rue Ferrari, for example. Yeah, they generally have services Monday through Friday, but I've been there on the weekends as well. I mean, there's always a staff person during the day to be able to provide an interaction or a service. Um, having previewed um, a report that you all will be seeing in the fall, there is some discussion also about how do we use volunteers more effectively, especially around the neighborhood um, of people who might be interested in providing additional support to the people that are living there. And I think if we had additional capacity to think about like how we might be able to utilize people that are in our community to help and to make a better connection to people who are living there, I think that's a huge opportunity. We just haven't had the time um, and the energy to really explore, but I do think there's a lot of exciting opportunity there. That's really a a good point because we get residents all the time who want to volunteer and help and they don't know how and we don't know how to direct them. So if you have volunteer opportunities and ideas, please let us know because we do have people in the community who, who want to give back in any way. Thank you for that. The last question I'll ask because I know my time is shortening is the security. What kind of security do we see at these sites? So for all the sites, or so the majority of the sites right now, we have 24 seven security. Um, we, again, when you see that report come back in the fall, uh, we're gonna provide you different options for security. We have the 24 seven security because that's how we, when we originally brought these models to council, we asked, did you want the low service, low, security model or do you want the best that we can provide? And you all said, we want the best. And so it does, you know, as a result, it is 24 seven and security we have found is really the most expensive, one of the most expensive cost drivers at these facilities. We've also learned that the residents inside really appreciate the security as well. So it's kind of an interesting dynamic, but it is one place where we could reduce costs if we thought about different models. Great, thank you very much. And, and just in closing, I'd like to thank you and Omar and Jim and the whole staff for coming up with a really good, viable solution for being able to establish an emergency interim housing facility in District 9. I am proud, frankly, that we're able to help our unhoused residents in this way. And I want to thank the Erickson neighborhood for being open to this solution. Thank you. Thanks, Council Member. Um, Council Member Cohen. Yes, thank you. Um, I want to thank staff for all the work. And I know this, this, this is a never ending work, but there's a lot that's gone into preparing for today. And, and I appreciate everything that your, the team has done on multiple fronts. Um, I'm gonna follow one more question kind of along the lines of what Councilmember Foley was just asking. What, I think a lot, many people are curious, always ask about what are the screening procedures used to decide who is eligible to come onto a site and, and do we anticipate a difference in terms of an EIH versus a uh, supportive parking site and what kind of screening is done? If we tease out Omar Passon's Deputy City Manager, just to tease out, Jackie's gonna answer most of this question, but some of those screening questions that you mentioned have taken the form of who is going to have access to the RV supportive parking, and some of them are what are the processes for somebody who's going into the interim housing type sites. Uh, we haven't um, worked all of the details for the supportive parking site, but the objective, as I mentioned during the presentation, that there, there was a prior council direction that essentially council offices in districts that support RV parking become the focus for, for where those sites come from. So one of the criteria will be where they are, um, and then again, the model for that particular option is trying to bring uh, people as a, as a group and lower the barriers. I think there was a comment on the during the call, lower the barriers that people need to get onto those sites. So we'll still work it out. That housing department will take the lead on working that piece out a bit as we get going. But but that's that piece, and then Jackie can give you a screening information on the interim. So it, you know, actually, Omar's description is not 
much different than what we did with the emergency interim sites, which is we made a commitment to all of the council areas where, you set, where we site that we always go to encampments that are in the surrounding neighborhoods. And we work with the council districts to identify what are encampments in that area that we will invite into the facility first. As these uh, facilities mature, then we have open slots. And what we've managed to do, because the city is paying for the majority of these, is that we're able to use the interim sites strategically when we work on different projects. So for the Guadalupe, you know, we were able, part of the success of that project was we were able to use the interim sites that were available, regardless of where they were, to move people into those uh, sites so that we could clear out a targeted encampment. That it was also true for the evacuee transition site. So we had 92 people living in tents on the interim facilities, but we needed to move them out and we utilized all the interim, emergency interim housing sites across. So it is really important to note that while the priority is when we open them up to get your residents in, we do use these sites strategically when we have special projects and yeah. when it's important. And I guess I wasn't really asking the question about geography, but more about the kind of screening that's used to determine whether someone's appropriately. So the screening yeah. is low barrier, right? So we're going to pick people from the particular sites. Um, and at this point, as we're looking at coming back with how do we create operational standards, you know, in, in the past, at times, we have done some screening for particular um, records. We've re resisted doing that because then it creates a barrier for people to enter the sites. And so my preference is when we come back in the fall, with a very detailed, here's how we plan to operate these sites and operate them consistently, that we provide more clarity on that. Or when this contract comes back, because we'll still have to have a provider for these sites, we can provide more clarity on the selection. Okay, thank you. Um, as many know, I've been talking a lot about the, the RV parking problem in North San Jose. I, I think North San Jose may be, if not the most, one of the most impacted locations in the city as far as RVs all over the streets. and. To give some examples, we have a business district in North San Jose with a lot of RVs on the street and businesses are leaving. Businesses are telling us they won't renew their leases. They're, the people who own the property are worried about losing their lease revenue because there are RVs there and they can't bring client, people can't bring clients into the site. We also have just on the border near the, the Berryessa location, but about two miles away is where Independence High School is. We have a lot of RVs parked along the back of Independence High School on Education Park Drive. The residents in the neighborhood are upset about it, the, the, the people at the school are concerned about it, and we haven't been able to tell them that we have a place to move the RVs. And I continue to tell people, I'm committed to finding a location, then we can begin to relocate these RVs, but we can no longer sit around and say we're gonna wait to find a location because the biggest complaint we get, I think, from residents is there are people here, there are homeless people nearby, and we tell them when we have a place, we're gonna to try to relocate them and offer them service. Um, one other example, we, we get RVs parked in the community center parking lot, and then people are bringing their families and going to the community center, and they're uncomfortable. And so, you know, the concern about who's in RVs, well, the RVs are out in prominent places that people are frequenting, and the idea is to find a place that will, that will give the services that RVs need um, and offer them a space. Um, so I've been pushing for expanding our uh, number of places we look for, look at when we look at RV and EIH. We had originally focused on public lands, as we know, and, and those weren't always the most appropriate. So um, fortunately, you know, we talked about expanding to private sites. I wanted to ask Nancy a couple questions. As we look at private sites around the city and we search for locations, can you just talk a little bit about the complexity, what you have to go through, and what what's out there? Good afternoon, Nancy Klein. Thank you very much. Uh, from economic development for, for the question. Um, the search for sites is extensive and it's multi-year. As you mentioned, we have consistently and still look at any publicly owned sites and have conversations with the agencies. We have also pursued many sites throughout the city, understanding that we're trying to spread the sites as equitably as possible. The, criteria for sites is extensive. The begins with trying to minimize 
any impact on housing or schools in adjacent areas. Um, there's clearly more uh, housing and schools than there are sites that are empty uh, throughout the city. We look for sites that have great surface areas, paved preferably, that um, have a minimum number of buildings. Berryessa site is 6.3 acres without any buildings on it, which is rare. Uh, we also look for sites of size, which are hard to find. Often we find sites that are one and a half or two acres, um, which provide limited opportunity to serve. Uh, we look for sites that have good access uh, in and out of them. We look for sites that are level. We look for sites that have utilities that can be easily pulled, for example, and that's just part of the list, um, and that decreases the cost to get the sites up and maintained. Um, and of course, working closely with many other uh, departments, including most importantly housing, but Department of Transportation and Public Works as well. So we've had many, many um, sites. We continue in North San Jose, particularly we have brokers which are scouring sites. Um, we check in with them weekly. Uh, we also have talked to several building owners, um, and uh, without naming names, to date, every single one of them has been opposed for a variety of insurance or future tenant access reasons, predominantly. Yeah, I appreciate that, and, and I'll, I'll get, in, maybe in my next round of questions or comments, I'll get to some talk about why I think that this uh, site at uh, Berryessa Road is particularly uh, a good site for this. Um, just going to comment a little bit about, uh, you know, I've been pushing for more sites in North San Jose. I'm glad Cerrone remains at the top of the list. I hope that colleagues on VTA will continue to push VTA to make that deal. I'm also working with members of the legislature and others to put some pressure on VTA as well to make this deal. If you've seen, saw the picture, you'll see that this VTA has a huge property with a lot of empty space. Um, we've already had a community meeting up there, which was well received. I, I think it's a great site, and we do need. Um, emergency interim housing in North San Jose, and this will be great because it's far enough North San Jose that we can actually begin to work with folks that live in Alviso and other places. Now we learned, I've learned in talking to some folks who talked to the people in these encampments, there's a resistance to moving too far. People have settled, set roots in an area and they don't actually want, if, even if we open another site in South San Jose, people who are now in Alviso or North San Jose are unlikely to accept that service. We need to have locations that are distributed around the city for the, so that people will have, will have more um, incentive to go. And I'm just gonna comment, I'll come back on the rest later, but I'll comment on um, the one item on the memo that I co-authored with uh, the rest of my colleagues um, about just making sure that we are explicit as a council about our intention when we bring people onto the EIH sites, because I have also heard people being uncomfortable or concerned that this is too short term, they're going to be um, put through a questionnaire every so often and maybe kicked out of the site, that makes them unstable, it makes them feel like they still have to keep their encampment somewhere else and go back and forth between the EIH site and the encampment to keep their other site so that when they lose their spot at the, uh, at the EIH, they're gonna have a spot to go back to. And I just think that providing some, some, some um, a position from council saying that our intention is to work with every individual case and not to have a specific time limit and give everyone the opportunity to be successful will help us get to attract more people to these sites. So that's why I wanted to make sure we also had this item in that memo to, to give people. I don't know if there's a comment on that. I just, wanted to, I just wanted to make sure that that was clear as to the importance of that statement. Yes, and actually that really is our position for all of the sites except for one because we have a limitation from one of the property owners um, that we can't have people stay for more than six months. I understand there's a provider who has this six month overview. And again, when we come back to you in the fall with um, a conversation about how we're gonna operate them consistently, that will be one of the one items that we can catch uh, with all of the providers, which is how they handle the ongoing um, need. And, and the message is that we are housing first. We want people to be able to stay, but we also want people to be working on trying to, you know, to find a solution to end their homelessness. Right. And I so that. that is something I think we'll be able to uh, ensure is consistent across the sites. 
once we come back to you in the fall. Okay, thank you. I just think it's good for us to, as a council, to go on record and and, and express our, our belief that we ought to be flexible. And I know that that is the intention yes, of the Housing and Department. I appreciate the council's yes, support yeah. in that philosophy of really working with people so that they can be, instead of creating artificial time frames that right. don't work for exactly. people Just setting, in Exactly, sending lives. a signal about our intention, I think, is important. So anyway, that's the end. I'll, I'll raise my hand one more time for a couple more comments. Great, thanks, Council Member. And I, I really do uh, appreciate all of your proactive advocacy um, and, and engagement with the community around both Berryessa and the Cerrone sites. And, and I agree, the Cerrone site uh, would be a great fit for the state tiny homes and other interim housing. Let's go, uh, we have uh, Councilor Batra is next. Thank you very much, <coughs> Mayor and all the council members who have spoken. Um, council Member Foley, if you can reread that line which you changed for my memo. Sorry. Changing the line to read, it's, this is item B, conduct a cost-benefit analysis of the Via del Oro site and present it to council for discussion. Okay. That's the only change. Okay, that's a better change. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, because what we were trying to prevent was that we didn't want to give a blanket approval at this stage, not knowing anything. We want to have a chance to learn all that. Okay, so, Thank you very much for uh, the staff for doing uh, all the analysis and the reports which you have been presenting. And I myself have seen the EIH. Uh, Jackie and uh, Jim Arbidal gave me a tour on the 25th of March after joining here on the 30th of Jan. And that was an extensive tour. I not only got to see the site, I got to see a lot of the details about how the site was planned, how it was executed, how clean it was. And I even got to talk to a resident uh, who was very inspiring uh, because she was looking to a better future. So having seen all that, I'm pretty impressed with the fact that you have studied what does it take to take a homeless person, give them a shelter, and then take them to a permanent shelter or a permanent housing, as you will call it. What I do have some trouble with, and I will come to those after my questions. I'm gonna ask a few questions. Uh, on 30th of May, we had a meeting with our district people, District 2010. Uh, Could you please summarize what were their three or four concerns of all the people who showed up? Councilor <clears throat> Batra, Omar Passons again. Um, so the, I think the meeting that you're referring to, there were uh, people who had, um, I think, some uh, objections about the number of uh, interim housing sites um, in districts two and 10. There were people who expressed concerns about um, issues that uh, that from their perception were uh, in proximity of varying widths and lengths uh, to the to the interim housing location. Those are the, the two foundational ones that I remember. I, I think there, there may have been one more that I'm missing right now though. Okay, so the idea about concentration in D2 and D10, we need to be able to dispel that with the data if you're claiming that they are almost equally distributed or they will get equally distributed over time because these are not the only EIH or the temporary housing we're gonna create. After multiple requests, you have been able to assemble the slide 10, which did not exist till about two days ago when we talked on Friday. So thanks a lot for working over the weekend and trying to get all that stuff done. So I think slide 10 of yours, uh, if you can pull it up. So council member, I, th I think you may mean slide, slide nine, uh, which is the pie chart that has the- No, no, the slide 10, which shows the t tabular data uh, in terms of where you're going, in terms of the number of, uh, number of each one of those units, where they are, what they're under construction, what's likely to be recommended. 
this slide has not existed till the Friday when we talked about 4.30. So this is your creation after 4.30 Friday, which I appreciate because this does give people a chance to understand where things are going, okay? And addressing the concerns which were expressed there, concentration was one, but the bigger concern was concentration really doesn't matter if the site is as clean as what I have seen, if the people know it. And also, they don't see the inside of the site every day. What they see is the outside. We have been very reluctant to make any commitment about how clean the area around it would be. What people have been asking is that, hey, you're taking care of the people who are gonna be residing inside but you're not taking care of us who are accommodating them. You're not willing to promise that you will keep the area as clean as it was before in a one mile radius. I think that is the concern. It is not a concern that the, you have had in D, D2 and D10, people who were extremely supportive. They were actually promoters, but they have turned against us. They have become unsupportive and they express their unsupport in that meeting, not because these people are not living in the right place or they don't deserve to live in the right place. It is because we have been reluctant to make a promise that we will keep the place clean around this area. We will not have another encampment, which we haven't been able to promise there, but we are going to be promising that on the Cherry Avenue situation in D9. They're asking, why not us have the same thing? So I totally agree the direction we are going in terms of wanting more EIH, even in D2 and D10. But what I have a trouble with is that we are not able to promise the things which these supporters want. And that is the reason why I wrote this memo and asking for it that the cost benefit analysis must include the additional services for the cost, uh, uh, for the cleanliness around this area in a one mile radius. So we will have a tremendous support mayor in terms of being able to place these EIH wherever we want, as long as we promise that we'll keep the area clean and we will minimize, if not eliminate, the encampments within that certain area. Other than that, we'll have probably successful EIH but very unsatisfied neighbors around it, which we cannot afford to do. Okay. Thanks for your comments, council member. And I, I will just note that there, there will be, uh, thanks to an MBA and a, and a BD from Councilor Jimenez and prior memos and discussion at the council, including some memos I, I co-authored or authored myself, there will be some discussion in the budget process, rest of the budget process around the notion of enhanced services, though, um, as you can see in the MBA that covers that, it's not a, um, an inexpensive proposition. It but, is I, not. but I do agree with your point that, uh, for lack of a better term, we need to be able to market these sites and demonstrate that they really clearly make neighborhoods better, not worse off, which they generally do, but it's not a good selling point when you have an RV or tent down the street. I, yeah. That is noted. Yeah. Um, any other I, Yes, point? so that, okay. that's my sermon, my... <laughs> dictation, whatever, in order to be successful, we need to be able to go with the complete package which says, yes, we will maintain this neighborhood with this level of cleanliness and this level of uh, crime reports less, fire report less, because there are medical calls exceeding than before. We talk about police calls. Yes, they are fewer, but the medical calls increase because people are sick, so we gotta take care of them. So we need to acknowledge that because these people are equally smart, sympathetic, compassionate, but we can't fool them with giving them half the data. Great, thanks council member. Thank you. Let's go to council member Ortiz. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I'm extremely thankful to the various teams who worked to produce uh, the item we're hearing today, uh, be it our real estate division, of course, PRNS staff, uh, city manager's office, and, and public works, and of course, housing. I'm grateful for everyone's coordination um, and dedication to ensure that 
um, we're treating our unhoused community with, with dignity, meanwhile balancing uh, any sort of safety concerns within our, our residents. Um, this is not an easy task, um, as we've heard uh, during public comment, uh, but I wanna applaud you all for working through the challenges um, that, present, uh, that continue to present themselves even uh, for future projects. Uh, I myself am supportive of you know, both permanent and uh, temporary housing, including EIHs, and I'll continue to make, well, I will make sure that District 5 does its fair share um, when the time uh, comes for us to support it. Um, we've all seen you know, the impact of the, the houseless crisis. You, know, you see it right outside City Hall, and for that reason, I'm, I'm personally gonna be supporting uh, the motion made by Council Member Foley. Um, and as we work to you know, prop up EIHs and more supportive parking sites and permanent uh, housing sites, I'm also interested in, in working with staff to see if we could identify some sort of metric or checklist that will allow us to start addressing um, sort of bad actors that we see in, in certain neighborhoods. We all have them and you know, I don't want to you know, target all the, the unhoused community, but in certain areas of District 5, there are some issues, and I believe that there needs to be some sort of strategy uh, to move forward that will allow us to address these challenges. Um, but I'm, I'm looking forward to the, the ongoing discussion, and I thank those members of the public who joined to provide their comments. Thank you. Mr. Mayor. Um, Council Member Batra had, had raised one point, and we have Jen Codian from Valley Water here. We may not need her to, to uh, provide questions, but they've been a really good partner, and one of his questions about why there's a, a water resources protection zone in one area and not another, it's just useful to know that that's a very, very sensitive area, and the, the state water board is sort of requiring certain things, and, and so there, there's a reason that that particular area is being moved forward. So I just wanted to clarify that point. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thanks for the clarification. All I'm saying is those people in those areas, they're looking for the same kind of cleanliness. And anywhere, wherever we have that ability, we should be proposing that with those sites because our goal is to get more sites. And that's a way to get it rather than create hard feelings over there. Okay. Okay. All right. Uh, since Thank I have you. the mic, Mayor. Uh, Actually, I've got council members who have not yet spoken. No, no, I will come I, back I, around to you. I, I don't need a round. I'm just saying, was the motion made? Does it need a seconder? Because it, the, the motion on the floor was made by Councilor Foley, seconded by Councilor Jimenez. Thank you. But then I don't so, need a second round. No, we're good. Thank you. Appreciate it. Okay, uh, let's see. Who's not spoken yet? Councilor Jimenez. Yeah, just a few brief, brief comments. And Councilor Member Batra, I, I appreciate you uh, elevating the discussion about the enhanced services. I can tell you that that was part of the discussion when the Burnell Monterey Road site and the Roof Ferrari site got, was stood up. And, and in fact, I think that was part of a memo that I wrote back, it seems like ages ago. And I think it was essentially shut down because uh, then city manager Dave Sykes, I think might have expressed that we just didn't have the resources. It wasn't something we could commit to. And the mayor and the majority council agreed with that. So it's, it's something that didn't go forward. And that's the reason during this budget cycle, I continue to try to resurface that. And so I appreciate you being on the same page with that because I think we need to show the residents that if they're willing to take on some of these locations that they can count on enhanced services and support for their community. So that way they can get more, we get more buy-in from them. And so I appreciate you lifting that up. Also just wanted to appreciate uh, council member Foley and, and members of the Brown Act for their willingness to adopt uh, or uh, it, um, include the memo that I wrote uh, as it relates to removing the Brunel site. I uh, also want to thank, uh, I know there's uh, folks from uh, Valley Water, obviously, on the District 9 site. Uh, certainly, Council Member Foley, Council Member Cohen, it, it's, it hasn't, it's been few and far between uh, as it relates to the number of council members that have risen their hand and said, put one in my district. <laughs> and so I, and I'm sure other council members up here, I know obviously Council Member Torres is, Fairly new to the council, but former council member uh, um, uh, Raul Perales, I'm sure, and I know uh, Deb Davis, uh, council member Davis has, has really uh, been some of the leaders in this space, and so we appreciate you all joining hands with us and saying that we want to, that you all want to be part of the solution and, and, and move this forward. So I, I greatly appreciate that. I know if there's residents of mine listening, I'm sure they're appreciative of your efforts, and, and we, we thank you for that. I, I think it's just important to not go unnoticed. 
As it relates to the Cerrone site, the VTA site in North San Jose, I want to tell you that I am super excited about it. It's a big site. Uh, uh, I know last week it was, it seems like ages ago, last week at the VTA meeting, I know there was a memo authored by uh, the mayor, me, and, and Council Member Foley uh, to bring forward the discussion on Cerrone to, to essentially make VTA sort of act a little bit more urgently on the matter. I can also tell you, and this may be new for some folks, but VTA staff expressed to me that part of the, their concern that they have heard was from the largest bargaining unit at VTA uh, having security concerns as it relates to interim housing solutions, specifically on that site, as an example. And so I, take it, I took it upon myself to actually, we have a meeting schedule. I think, if you know the meeting off the, the meeting day on top of your head, Omar, but it's with- it's the uh, 29th. It's the 29th of June with uh, ATU members, which is the largest bargaining unit at VTA, to educate them about what EIHs are, what, they, what it means to have one of those, and really to try to get buy-in and to allay some of the fears that they may have that has prevented the site from moving forward. And so I am fully supportive of doing everything I can as a board member, as I'm sure others up here are as well, to try to get that uh, finally across the finish line. Um, and uh, and so, I, so I hope to, to be celebrating that uh, really soon. And so with that, I had other comments. I had a bunch of numbers written down, things I was gonna, I was gonna get a slide 10, nine, and five, you know, but I'm not gonna do all that. Um, but I, I very much appreciate all the work. I know this isn't easy to do, and I know you often have to have a lot of meetings with us, with the, with the community, and we have to, I, I've, we often, and I know I've done it, have to tell the community that uh, you're simply the messenger, and we're the ones sending you out to do some of this work. And so I appreciate the resilience that you've shown going into the lion's den time and time again, uh, willing to take some of those hits, knowing that you're doing the work that we asked you to do. We appreciate you, and uh, I hope this is the beginning of a lot of other great work around the city. Thank you. Thanks, Councilmember. Appreciate that, and really appreciate your efforts with VTA and, and ATU. I really hope it bears fruit. Um, I, I do. I just want to make sure, just before I forget, that we do ask staff what, if any, risks or costs. Does anyone need to be aware of of taking Bernal? off as a, removing it as a backup option, at least for now. What, just help us understand with the 200 units from the state and the timeline, just wanna make sure we have complete information. Yeah, th thank you, Mr. Mayor. The, I think the thing for people to know is that there really are just some really just flat out trade-offs. The, the governor essentially said um, in his message announcing this, we wanna do this now. We wanna help you now. We wanna pay for this now. We wanna design this now. And so part of our challenge, Jim and I have been working with, with the Department of General Services of the state, and they have essentially said, there are four jurisdictions who get these, and we're gonna work as quickly as we can with the ones that are ready. And so um, some, I if we can't get Cerrone and, and Cherry, which by the way is our go-to, we are pushing hard. Um, not having that backup may create a situation where we just don't get, um, where we, we, in the extreme, where we don't get to, to use those units. So it's just useful for folks to know. Is there anything you need to add to that, Jim? I, I'd add a couple of things, too. Um, the motion also has uh, slot roof Ferrari in as the backup. And as I reported to council during my presentation, we're, we're well into design. We're moving to complete the design to get it out to an RFP process early this summer. Uh, we're coordinating those designs with Caltrans now. A and we, we intend to continue down that path unless the council tells us to hold off because it might be used as a backup. We continue to yeah. proceed forward there. Um, I actually appreciate you mentioning that, Jim, and I'll, I'll let you finish your thought, but I, I do want us to just note that we may need to entertain a friendly amendment. I forgot about that wrinkle around how far you are with Rue Ferrari and that it's not actually, currently at least, without some significant change and in incurring some cost, it's not actually a viable backup option. But well, and I, I guess I would say this. It, it, could, it could be if we just stopped doing what we're doing. Um, but the, the, I think the really unique opportunity about the roof Ferrari is much of the expansion is happening within the current perimeter. So we're not expanding too far out on the site. Yes, we are expanding some. I think we're, we're making a very efficient use of that site, a lot of it within it. There is a vacant piece at the far southern end, um, south of the PG&E electrical easement to Burnell Road that we are not planning on expanding to. 
So that could be a smaller, I don't recall off the top of my head the exact size of it, but so if we were to use that as a backup, if we had to go to the backup, Cerrone didn't work for some reason, um, that would be the area that I think I would focus on with the state, not the area within the perimeter fence or the area that we have designed. Public Works already has an RFQ to pre-qualify contractors out, so we're going to be identifying those uh, pre-qualified firms early in the summer and wanting to get that out to RFP. That's been the direction of the council to try and move on that as quickly as possible. We do have one other alternative site that the council has previously approved that we still have as an alternate, the 85 Great Oaks site. Granted, it's, it's, it's in that area, but you know my recommendation, not having cleared this with Omar and Jennifer, but just letting you know, my thought is that south end of Rue Ferrari and 85 Great Oaks, between that, if we aren't successful, hopefully we are at Cerrone and, and Cherry, if we aren't, those would be the places that we would start to look. And I bet we're just gonna have to ha be flexible, nimble, and try and figure it out. You know, nothing typically works on the first try yeah. exactly as we envision it on the, on the day that we're discussing it here. Yeah. Okay. So thanks for, for hearing that part of it. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. I just wanna make sure we had the full context on how you interpret the backup options, where you are with Rue Ferrari is a helpful note. Um, so the, the RFQ you're about to go out for is inside the fence, the existing fence line? Is that what I just heard? The, the RFQ is already out. So we are out okay. to pre-qualify firms. They don't have the design details that, that will come at a later point. But our level of design now has most of the expansion within the, exhibit, the perimeter fence. But we are expanding some to the south to the PG&E easement line, but not south of the PG&E. So there is a yeah. parcel at the southern end that is going to be untouched. Okay, so there's still possible expansion. That, that's space. correct. Okay, Okay. thank you for those clarifying points. Let's go to Councilman Dwan. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, staff. I, you, you guys had a, an incredible, challenging task it's almost, you're in a catch-22. If you don't do anything, you're gonna get yelled at for it, and if you do something, you're gonna get yelled at one way or another. But I think if we, we have to take some type of action, right? We can't be a stalemate, and I applaud you for doing that. These two site, and, and I appreciate um, our council member Batra um, talking about keeping the area clean uh, after we establish uh, the EIH but by, by having these particular area activated, it's actually start cleaning up by removing RVs, removing vehicles, and getting encampment off the street. Right off the bat, that's a win. And I, and I, I appreciate that very much, and, and I'm very supportive of our council member Foley uh, motion, um, and again, we are taking a step forward. We're not taking a step backward. And I want our citizen to understand somewhere, somehow, not in your backyard, but it might be in your front yard. So we need to take some type of action to clean up our street, help our unhoused resident back on their feet, and bring back businesses. Because I, even in District 7, there's multiple businesses have left D7 because of all the problems that we have. And it's not to blame just the unhoused residents, it's a multiple factors. But again, I applaud you for doing a great job. Thank you. Thank you, council member. Okay, we're back around to Councilmember Cohen. I'm sorry, apparently Vice Mayor had her hand up, it's not on my screen, but I see it now. I apologize, I'm gonna go to the Vice Mayor first. Sorry about that. <clears throat> I was wondering, oh, when's my turn? When's my turn? So I apologize. Um, but I just, I also wanted to thank staff. You know, this is really complicated work. I also wanted to thank my colleagues. Um, and, you know, to echo what uh, Council Member Jimenez said, uh, we all want to be part of the solution. One of the things about D1 is that there just isn't a lot of land. And even on private property, uh, there, you know, as Nancy mentioned, there are not a lot of takers. You know, I'm going to the faith-based community to see what we can do for safe parking. Uh, so I think that each of us is, uh, really is trying to do what we can with what we have. Uh, it is a huge problem. 
Uh, we want these safe managed environments and a balanced approach. And I think that that's what the community deserves. That's what our unhoused community also deserve. Um, I think that they both want to be safe and they want it in a clean environment. So I agree with Councilmember Batra that we're we are making a huge investment. We will continue to invest in this. So I think that we're taking this extremely seriously. We're going to do something about it and um, move forward with it. <clears throat> I think that we should continue to move for look for auctions. I um, would love to do whatever I can, Councilmember Jimenez, uh, for the Cerrone site. I think that we really need to push in each and every way that we can to help them to provide what is necessary for uh, the, uh, the employees to feel safe. At the same time, if there's needs for guards or whatever it is to make them feel safe, uh, we should do it because I think that Cerrone site is ideal. If we could just get that moving, uh, that would be the preference. I also think that our friends at Santa Clara County uh, need to be part of the equation. I would like to add as a friendly amendment, if it's okay, uh, to add the, uh, the fairgrounds as a potential uh, lease. Uh, if we're able to lease at least two or more acres, it's a big piece of property. If we could lease it for five years or, you know, I mean, they're not really gonna do, I don't think have plans in the next five years. Um, I think that we should take the leadership to go to them and see what we can do as well as direct staff to put it on the list. Uh, because I think that the fairgrounds uh, could be a potential, uh, at least you know, um, temporarily uh, for a period of five years or so. I think that that would help us uh, quite a bit. And it would also provide sort of a way in which the county can also be involved in providing the services right there at the fairgrounds. So I would add that little bit if it's okay uh, with uh, Council Member Foley. Absolutely, I'll accept that as a friendly amendment. Thank you, and Council Member Jimenez? I'll just say I'll accept it as a friendly amendment, but I, <laughs> I think the county time and again has, has been reluctant to use the fairgrounds, and so I, you know, I, I, I'm not interested, just my perspective, and interested in taking a combative approach to that because I think we need that relationship and we can't continue over the years, I'm talking historically, continue to erode that relationship, and so I'm supportive of it if it's done the right way, but I suspect that the answer is gonna continue to be no, but I, I'll, I'm willing to accept it. Yeah, I, I, I totally understand, and I think that it does not have to be combative, I think that there are ways in which we could find things that they want to do and participate in and things that we want as well. And I think that given our relationships with, uh, with the supervisors and, and, and the county, uh, it might be uh, helpful. So um, with that, I, I really want to appreciate uh, all of what has been said and certainly the work that the staff has done has been remarkable. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, Vice Mayor. Okay, Councilor Cohen. Yeah, thank you. Um, and first I wanna thank the colleagues who have talked about Cerrone, um, and thank you, Councilor Jimenez, particularly for your, sounds like, leadership with VTA and trying to, to get people on board. It's been frustrating. Obviously what we hear from everybody, whether it's neighbors, residential neighbors, or other neighbors, or VTA employees, there's, there's a misconception about what an EIH site is. People, I, I think people, when they first hear about something coming, they think, well, you're gonna take what we see over there as an encampment and we're just gonna move it wholesale and plop it over here and it's gonna be an encampment here instead of over there and that's not what it is and it's unfortunate that even an organization like VTA can't you know, work with us more closely and so I'm glad you're, you're taking leadership to try to help them understand the difference and, and, the, and the actual benefit that, they, that all of us will see from using their site. So I wanna thank you on that. I also wanna say I'm not done in District 4 even if Cerrone's approved. I mean, I'm, I, I continue to, to feed sites to Nancy and her team there's two other sites I've already talked to her about, and I'm hoping that maybe one of them will pan out. Um, it'll spread it out in District 4, but also spread it out in the city. Um, so we gotta continue looking at those sites. While, I mean, I don't wanna add anything as backups at this point, we're too far away from that. Similarly to the county, I mean, my, my preference is for us to continue to have those conversations with the county without necessarily explicitly putting it in a motion because we should have those conversations, find out if they're amenable, and then add it to our list of backups. But, you know, I, I, that's a minor, a minor point for me. Um, we ought to continue looking for other sites and continue to see if we have the resources 
to build more interim housing or other services. Um, just going to say one last thing about um, the Berryessa site. You know, there's been one of the questions that's been asked of me this week by, by people was, you fought so hard against the site at Noble. Why are you fighting so hard for the site at Berryessa Road? And, I, you know, at Noble, there were four, I think you heard me right at the beginning of that conversation last June when I said there's four problems with this site at Noble. Number one, it's not really that great for public transit. It's not right next to a public transit line. The site at Berryessa is, a, is right near BART and the, the uh, transit hub which has all of VTA coming into it. There's almost no better site as far as transit. Number two, it's not near, it's a, it was over a mile, almost a mile and a half to the nearest shopping and services for, for people who would live at the Noble site. This one is near a shopping center. People will have resources and things that they need who are at this site, and I think that's important. Number three, that site was across the street from a, from a, nurse, from a preschool, an elementary school, and a block from a middle school, and two blocks from another elementary school. This site, the nearest school is one and a half miles away from this site. I don't think there's any other site in the city we've ever proposed for a site like this that's as far from the nearest school. And you know, while I've said I don't think there's incompatibility necessarily, if that's a primary concern of our, of our residents of the city, then this site is, you know, alleviates that concern. And obviously number four was that site was taking what was a um, dedicated parkland open space used heavily for trails, bringing people to the Penitentia Creek Perk Ponds, this site is an industrially zoned site that was used as a truck depot that's paved behind a fence. And honestly, I didn't even know it was there until it came forward for, through this broker for the, for the use of the property. It was not a site that it's paved and eventually, in theory, would be another industrial site. So there's a, there are worlds of differences. And, and if it can't be done at this site, I don't think there's a site in the city where it can be done. So I am committed to making it work, and I'm committed to the residents of that neighborhood to making it work. But I think it's really a good site for this kind of service. So I'm appreciative to staff for finding it and for making this, pushing it this far forward. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Completely agree. Um, see, I think Councillor Dewan, is your hand back up? Yes. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, thank you, Vice Mayor, for. Uh, you know, mentioning about the um, Tolly Fairground, it is in my district. I'm in very supportive of that, and and I believe that in order to make an impact, because District Seven encumber about 30 percent of unhoused residents, and RVs are on Tolly Seventh Street and many other area it is heavily heavily concentrated, and I believe that if the county willing to work with us and as much as we are willing and more than happy to work with the county to find a, like you said, anywhere between three to five acres, it would solve a lot of our problems. And, and not only is this putting RVs in there, we're gonna use the county land right there. They can support us by, ha you know, wrap around services for unhoused residents. That's including drug rehabilitation and mental illness and healthcare, and um, I definitely thank you for that friendly amendment and support it. Thank you. Great, thank you. It's great to hear, Council Member. Um, and Vice Mayor, I'm sorry, is your hand still up or did I just fail to put it down? I'm sorry. Okay, I don't see any other hands. I wanna thank my colleagues uh, for all the great comments and supporting the sites that we are moving forward. This is a very meaningful step forward in our expansion of interim sites and and will assuming we move forward quickly and diligently here will will have a measurable notable impact on the state of encampments and lived-in vehicles in the city so i think this is going to be a win-win for everybody and i think with that we are ready to vote Motion passes unanimously. Great, thank you. All right, well thanks again to everyone. Look forward to talking about how we fund the construction and operation of all these sites next week. We will move on to. Mayor, 8. I thought we were gonna. 8.5. Yeah. Oh, we have to I vote was, separately yeah. on 8.5, I apologize. Yes. I'll move approval of 8.5. Second. Ready? Ready. Okay. 
Right. Motion passes unanimously. Uh, Mayor. Thank you. Mayor. I, yes. I actually, I just, I wanted to uh, provide some quick comments on 8.5 before I know we oh, already voted. We but actually discussed them concurrently. You can go ahead and make a comment now if you'd like. But just, uh, I just, I wanted to thank Council Member Cohen. This uh, RV location is now in my district, but it started when it was in this district and he literally handed it <laughs> off to all of us <laughs> before giving it to me. So, um, but um, I know we're gonna be working together. So thank you again for your leadership, uh, Council Member Cohen. Thanks, Council Member. Appreciate it. Okay, so we are um, back now to item 6.2, which is the public hearing on residential garbage and recycling service rates. I have a script. Uh, go for it, thank you. Subsequent to ESD's sub, um, supplemental memorandum dated June 2nd, the city clerk's office has received 16 additional residential garbage and recycling rate protests. Therefore, the total number of valid written protests is 285 for the proposed residential garbage and recycling rates. And then after the speakers, I have another part of the script. Do we have a presentation? Or are we just going to public comment? Okay. Sorry, we'll just go to public comment. We do not have a staff presentation. Um, I'm looking for I have no hands up, and I have no speaker cards for item 6.2. So I will okay. proceed to the next part of my script. Oh. Thank you. Hi. Blair Beekman, thanks a lot for taking my public comment. Uh, I'll just quickly offer uh, the importance of uh, subsidies. Is, is, uh, it's a really good thing to be able to talk about it openly. Uh, and uh, good luck how you can be doing that uh, with this sort of item, to make that clear to each other in how issues can be talked about. Uh, subsidies, it, it really is helpful. And uh, I hope it's a conversation we don't fear having. and. Uh, it's understandable for all of us and everyone can feel safe uh, about its conversation. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, the total of all written protests during the public protest period um, together with the speaker who did not sound like he was protesting the rate changes today represents less than 1% of all customers impacted by the change in residential garbage and recycling rates. Therefore, council may consider staff's recommendation for residential garbage and recycling rate increases. Thank you. We are back to the council. Let's we'll see. Hands, do we have a motion? Move approval. Thanks, council member. Let's vote. Who is the second on that? Davis. Let's go. Let's go. Motion passes with um, Candelas voting no and Kame and Jimenez absent. Okay, thank you. Let's go on to item six. <laughs> Before I clear the vote, yes, and okay, so we have a uh, motion passes with 10 yes votes and one no from Councilmember Candelis. Okay, thank you. Let's go to item 6.3 municipal water system, uh, potable and recycled water rates and charges. You have a statement? They'll be the same before and after speakers. Subsequent to ESD supplemental memorandum dated June 2nd, 2023, the city clerk's office has received 24 additional potable water rate protests. Therefore, the total number of valid written protests is 176 for the proposed potable water rates. No protests have been received in response to the proposed recycled water rates. For public speakers, I have Steve Benetti. Thank you, Mayor. Um, well, I left my glasses at home, so I had to make it 15 pike on this. Uh, I vote to table this vote. 
uh, like we table needed work at the Cunningham Park. Uh, we're told that we need to raise the water rates because we're using less water. But in 50 years, I I've never seen the water rates go down. Uh, why is that? Uh, we would like to see the money trail of all these entities from, from the local, the state, all the dams, all this stuff. I'd like to see their budgets um, so that we know that you folks are looking at this and seeing if we can cut money here or there and they're not overdoing things. Um, like the Orville Dam. I mean, they screwed up and didn't do the, the spillway right. How much a year do we got to pay for that? Uh, and who was punished? I don't think anybody was. Uh, my brother was part of that 200,000 evacuating. Um, our, our county here, we, uh, we have a flood here every 10 years. I, I've talked about this before. Uh, the last one, Rock Springs and all along Coyote Creek. Uh, are we paying for that too on our water bill? Uh, how much a year do we pay on that? Um, how are we going to prevent more floods? I'd, I'd like to go more than 10 years without a flood. Um, again, um, these water districts is a public monopoly. Uh, I'd like to see uh, how much the top 10 executives are getting paid. Uh, they shouldn't make any more in our mayor. Um, and, and one more thing, the, the last. Uh, they're on Tully Road with, uh, in, uh, at Capitol. You know, why do we have city uh, vehicles, trucks, and water company trucks? Uh, they're blocking a fire hydrant. They block the, Thank you. Uh, the bicycle trail. Oh, got it. Thank you. Um, there are no speakers on Zoom. Where? Um, the toll of all written protests during the public protest period, together with the speaker protesting the rate changes today, represents less than 1% of all customers impacted by the change in water retail rates. Therefore, the council may consider staff's recommendation for municipal water system rate increases. Thank you. Okay. I'm going to come back to the council. Jeff, I do actually have a quick question. I don't know if you're, sorry, I don't know if you're on call for this. I, I do have a question <laughs> I'm glad you're doing constituent services and sir thank you for coming we'll get Jeff right back up to you in a moment I just want to grill him with a couple questions first um, so Jeff one thing I'm struggling with a little bit is I believe we were told that part of the rationale for rates going up as quickly as they are is that the utility has high fixed costs as usage has gone down Therefore, you, you need a higher rate to actually capture the funds to pay for those high fixed costs. Okay, makes sense, but w w shouldn't we also assume that given the abundant rain we just had, that now we would likely see usage go up in the next year or two? So now people are going to be hit with a double whammy of using more water and therefore just paying more in general, but also the rate, the, the tax on a per gallon basis going up at the same time. And if we count, is that projected? Did you assume an increase in the consumption of water in the coming years, given the huge amount of rainfall we just had? Got it. Thank you. Great question. Uh, Jeff Provenzano, Deputy Director, ESD, Municipal Water System. It's actually it's going to be the other direction, and I'll do a couple comments and explain why. Um, we're, uh, even though we're out of the drought and there's plenty of water supply, we're actually seeing record low water usage as we go through the rest of this year. Um, March was down about 30% compared to last year, and that was a drought year. April is down about 20, May down right around 15%. Um, we're, we're projected now with the cooler weather raining today in June, we're going to end this fiscal year well below what we had anticipated we're going to end the year in revenue and fund balance. Um, and that has an impact into next year. Um, most of our water sales are in the summertime, um, where we get the majority of our water sales and we're trending so low from even below last year. Um, we'll move through the summer. Hopefully water sales pick up a little bit and it'll help as we go through next year. Um, and so no, water sales are actually down and tracking low. Um, way back in the pre-recession in 2007, 2008, a common uh, theory was like for water conservation was like a spring, spring theory. You push down on the spring, as soon as you take your pressure off, it bounces right back. Uh, it didn't happen uh, during uh, the drought and the recession. We had one at the same time. 
And then we saw the same effect at uh, 2013 drought, 2017 drought, and we're anticipating the same now in that um, every time we push down in the spring, it doesn't bounce back. It could take several years to slowly increase, and it never fully goes back to what it was before the previous drought. Um, moving on, I know I kind of mentioned it, water usage right now, uh, we're ending this year at the lowest water usage we've seen in 40 years. Um, and even though we're not uh, you know, mandating or, or telling customers they have to conserve, there is a messaging out there still. Valley Waters Board back in April uh, voted to continue to call for a two-day a week watering. Um, the State uh, Water Resource Control Board, they just extended the ban on watering of ornamental turf in front of commercial, industrial, and institutional properties, which includes HOAs. That's non non-functional turf or um, grass that's not used for recreation. Um, and in, in addition, there was a state law passed in September, that was SB 1157, if you, if you track those things. Um, and that one, um, that mandates that water utilities continue to make progress on reducing indoor water conservation between now and 2030. We need to reduce per capita usage indoors by about 25% between now and 2030. So even though the drought's over and there's tons of water, there's still this uh, pressure uh, uh, to continue to maintain uh, the pace of conservation and even go lower. And we're seeing historic lows. Um, we're ho actually hoping that they do increase a little bit because we budgeted water to be um, the same as last year, drought year, and we're tracking lower. So we would like to see it upcrease a little bit. It'll help uh, through the next budget cycle. Long answer, but that's yeah, it. no, that was informative. That's why I need the staff presentation. That was uh, that was good. That was helpful. Um, so yeah, what I'm hearing is when we push down on the spring, as you put it, there's behavior change that occurs. There are investments that occur. People take out lawns. People invest in water conservation technologies, and therefore the demand, the usage, doesn't bounce up ne necessarily as high or as quickly when a drought is over. Um, it also sounds like it's somewhat weather dependent. Uh, I, I guess, it, so the, the good news there would be, while the rate may be going up 14%, which certainly gives me sticker shock, if usage is down, in theory, the amount of dollars out of pocket for folks may not be going up 14% if usage is down. Well, if you, I, I would assume that's correct. Yeah, that's correct. And we also do outreach on water saving tips. They're trying to, uh, indoor water saving tips that people can, um, techniques and, and, and tips uh, indoors and outdoors on, on what they can do to yeah, reduce water usage and really offset that, that increase. So Cost. let me just ask this. If, yeah, I appreciate that. If, if it starts heating up, we see, you should, we see that spring bounce back up, usage shoots up because we have abundant water for now and, uh, and it's hot again. At some point, do you all get to a point where you're at cost recovery and you come back and say, we don't need all this 14%? Um, as we go through next year, it, it would probably be, um, you know, I have a lot of thought on this, it, it would be in the spring of next year, depending upon weather uh, and messaging on conservation, to be in the spring of next year. If we do exceed our water sales targets, generate a little bit more revenue, that goes into fund balance and is used to offset any, any rate increases next year. Wholesale water rates, uh, you may, may remember wholesale water rates are increasing pretty significantly are gonna double over the next six years. Um, so we will be most likely back here again with the rate increase every year to, to pass that cost on. As a water utility, buying water is 68% of our cost, 4% uh, is electricity. Uh, so 72% of everything that we charge our customers just passes right through us and goes back to the, um, our bills on buying water or electricity. So we actually run the utility on about 28% of a typical bill. Um, and so when those costs go up, uh, we pass those on to our customers, and they are projected to go up significantly over the next six years. Right. Yes, and I know we've had some discussion in recent years, so we should be talking to Valley Water in the state, it sounds like, yes. those of us who are concerned. Um, I had a final question for you, but it now escapes me. It will, I'm sure, come back to me. You may want to stick around. I see a few other colleagues' hands up, but appreciate those informative answers and um, oh I'm sorry here's my final question how do we compare to other water retailers uh, there is a comparison in the council memo yep. um, I saw it I just yep. want to make sure yep. just for the public uh, we're, we're right around there uh, right around the middle range um, it can vary depending upon customer base how 
well customers responded in each service area compared to drought, uh, water use reduction, businesses, and percentage yeah. of outdoor watering, but we're right in that middle range right now. Even after the increase, we'll be mid-range. Yes. Yep. Thank you. Okay. Councilor Cohen? Yeah, thank you. I, ha I have some questions for you as well, Jeff. Um, for, first of all, you know, I know see water use hasn't gone back up, and I think that's a good thing. Um, I don't think it's a healthy message for us to say, hey, we had a lot of rain this year, therefore everyone should start using more water. Mm -hmm. I also don't think it's a healthy message for us to say, hey, if you want your water rates to go down, use more water. I, I, I hope that we are not going to be sort of sending that message by the comments we just made. Conservation should be a way of life, and we have to know that we're living in a, <laughs> in a place where it's likely that this is gonna, cycle is going to repeat itself. Having said that, it is obviously nice that you know, the aquifers are recharged in our area, and I call it a creek on my street that's formed in the gutter because I live close enough to the hills that there's actually a stream running down the side of our road. It was started in the first week of January, and it's still running today, six months. Of course, all that water is going straight out into the bay and not being captured, but that's another conversation for the water district. Are most of these increases due to the wholesale, the increase in the wholesale cost of water being charged to us by Valley Water and by F SFP? PC? Uh, yes, by far that's sort of the biggest uh, reason for the rate increases, yes. Right, so I mean it, a lot of this is out of our hands. I guess my, my question would be most of the other water companies are increasing their rates by 9, 10, 11 percent and ours are 14 percent. Can you set my mind at ease about the historical trends and why maybe that's happening? I mean, or maybe give me an explanation as to yeah, why Yeah, sure. I mean, it, um, it kind of goes back to um, usage base. A majority of San Jose Municipal Water System is single-family residential. When we go through a drought, um, our, our revenue and water sales um, are impacted in that the most common way of achieving water reduction uh, during a drought is to go to single-family residential, limit the amount of outdoor water usage, and then focus on indoor efficiencies. Um, it really helps us uh, to achieve water reduction standards, but um, and there is some, uh, some focus on, on, um, on businesses to reduce usage, usage, but usually it's on the outdoor watering. Um, the state law that passed uh, in September, that was SB 1157, uh, part of that um, going forward is for water utilities to look at high using businesses, high water using businesses, and to develop performance measures to help them reduce their water usage. But going back to answer your question, um, because a percentage, the vast majority of the areas that we serve are single-family residential, um, we see a, a big drop. That's, the, that's where we focus on conservation, uh, typically or historically in droughts. Most other retailers don't have that mixture. We're, um, to give you a number here, 25,000 uh, customer accounts, 20,000 are single-family residential. Uh, many of the other water retailers, it's more split, like 50-50. And so they, not only do they see um, water usage, it's more difficult for them to reduce water usage um, in, in calls to conserve, but when businesses start back up, they, they ramp up a little bit faster. Okay, I'm gonna kinda, I got a little confused in that explanation. Sure. Um, North San Jose, which is one of the two areas you cover, is actually very high apartment and not single family home. It's almost all, um, multifamily residential. So I'm curious about your numbers. I mean, is, sure. it, is it really true that that high of a fraction is single family, especially, and then can, I'll get to my next question, which was about the difference in cost between North and San Jose and, and Evergreen. You you actually have two rates. You're not unifying the rates over the entire system. North San Jose's rates are, looks like 12, 13% higher than the rates in the uh, Evergreen area. Mm -hmm. And so I'm, I want to f understand that better. I think partly it's due to the fact that you're getting water from that North San Jose gets water from SFPUC, and the other gets water from San Jose, from from the Valley Water System. But I I'm not sure if that explains it. But can you? I asked sure, a lot yeah. of questions there. Can you talk about some a of those? Few, a few in there. So North San Jose is a little bit different. You're right. Um, not mostly or very very little single family residential. Mostly multifamily. And then when it comes to water reduction standards, it's been mostly on the outdoor side. Uh, we're seeing right now in, in North San Jose, uh, just like in, in the Evergreen area, record low uh, water usage uh, going back uh, 30 some odd years. Um, a lot of it is weather dependent uh, in North San Jose and it's, uh, it's the grass ornamental turf um, and outside in front of businesses. Um, that's where we're seeing the, the, biggest, uh, the biggest cutback. And then the, the rate itself, the water up there, uh, our, our meter fee, uh, it goes across um, 
all the service areas, but the quantity charge in North San Jose is really based around San Francisco's. Uh, San Francisco went uh, back in uh, the late 2000s, embarked about a 10-year uh, CIP program to upgrade their whole Hetch G water system. And in North San Jose at the time, uh, uh, water usage, uh, the cost of the water spiked. Um, different factors there for San Francisco, but had to do with recession, drought, lower water sales, and, and bond obligations. But they, the water price spiked very significantly compared to Valley Water. And then what we're seeing now, though, as um, those, and, and those North San Jose and some of the other agencies that are off that have actually seen a couple years of zero or very low rate increases on their quantity charges. Um, and then on the Valley Water side, they're catching up and almost uh, equal to the same rate as San Francisco. So the issue here is, I mean, if you look at this chart that shows the, the ranking of rates in the Bay Area, and um, while you say we're in the middle of the pack, North San Jose is fourth out of the entire, all the jurisdictions listed. San Francisco is number one. So it's, it, is this the reason why they're number one is also the reason why North San Jose is, is as high as it is? Uh, yes, and Redwood City is up there too. Those are those are um, company agencies that use uh, San Francisco water. Okay, so I guess so. And you and you, unlike the other water agencies, you do differentiate on your on your um, where you're delivering in terms, and rather than spread it across the entire system. Uh, that's correct. Yes. And your cost recovery model, you don't, you know, because unlike Great Oak and, and uh, San Jose Water Company, you're not, this is a non, not a for-profit organization. Correct. You're, this is all based on covering cost and just cost recovery, and there's not a uh, profit, any uh, excess. That's correct. We are cost recovery, and uh, any, any revenue over what our exact costs are go into the pot and are used to offset any, any cost the following year. Okay. Um, Explain to me one more time the, the fact that we're, our rates are going up by more than the other agencies around us again. I just want to understand that one more time. I didn't quite Sure, the, the, the way rates are calculated is we look at our water sales, both how we're going to end the year in water sales and then water sales projections next year. Uh, that's both a revenue and then a cost component um, with that. So we look at how much water of each type we're going to buy and then how much water of each type we're going to sell. Those are our major costs. Um, and then uh, the raise rates to, to match the, the revenue, to have the revenue match uh, the cost is called a revenue requirement. And so we look at how, basically it's how much water we think we're going to buy and how much water we think we're going to sell. Okay. And I know you can't speak for other companies' rates. I, I'm, it's, it's, it's striking to me that some of our residents who are served by Great Oaks are basically paying nearly, I mean, only 50 to 60 percent of what North San Jose would be paying. Is there, do you have any sure. thoughts about why that is? Yeah, and I should mention that with the two uh, private or investor owned, um, one's private, uh, San Jose Water Company is investor owned. For those um, just over the years in, in, in presenting this information to council, uh, kind of like a, a, some sort of figure, they actually raise the rates um, potentially multiple times during the year. So the number in there um, was uh, the, the most relevant information that we could uh, gather off the internet. Um, but the way it really works for both is that um, they do a three-year rate schedule, but when it comes time to raise rates, they uh, redo all their accounting, submit it to the PUC, PUC and then they'll get um, a rate adjustment, approved a rate adjustment. So um, that was really our best guess estimate on the information that was available for both um, San Jose Water Company and Great Oaks. If you're in, the, in those service areas, you would have... Um, maybe um, experience their drought surcharges over the past couple years. Uh, the way that works, we don't do drought surcharges here um, with Muni Water. Uh, the way the drought surcharges work, if, if either of those agencies over collect on that surcharge, it goes into a pot and then they use um, that extra revenue to offset uh, rate increases going forward. It, it also has a way of shifting their revenue in, in an essence um, where the higher users are paying a, a greater proportion of the revenue. Uh, both agencies are moving or have moved off drought surcharges, and as they move forward um, with their filings with the PUC, uh, they'll look at their, um, their balance sheets, um, how much, if there's any revenue left in, in dr from drought surcharges in a holding pot, um, and that will be used to offset any rate increases or recalculate uh, what their, this year's rate increases will be. Um, both are doing increases July 1st to account for wholesale water, 
but when it comes to their own individual increases, Tennessee Water Companies, for example, is in January. So just, just to understand that last piece, um, the, the drought surcar charge is on top of the proposed monthly bill here. So when it says 88 for Great Oaks, if they're doing a drought surcharge, it's more, whereas we don't have that surcharge on ours. So it's actually less of a difference between what people pay than it looks like on this table. Uh, yeah, I'll see if I can say that better. It, uh, last year's memo, their numbers were significantly higher than this year because they had drought surcharges and we could calculate that in to compare apples and apples with ours. Because they got rid of them, uh, those drought surcharges, it, it, in the data there, it shows that their numbers are much lower, but there is a recalculation needed for both companies as we go through this year. Thanks, Councilmember. Good questions. Uh, Councilmember Candelas. Thank you, Mayor. Um, a quick question for you, Jeff. Um, uh, you know, I, I understand that the increase is, is largely based on um, our wholesalers jump in, in, in price of water. Um, I, so I guess my, my question for you is what kind of engagement do we have with whether it's Valley Water or SF, the SFPUC on the rate setting process um, and, 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 and our, our approach as, as a city? Um, for San Francisco, uh, we belong to an agency called Bosca Bay Area Water Supply and Conservation Agency. Um, and one of the main purposes of that agency, it's a 26-member uh, agency of uh, most of the cities that buy water from San Francisco. Um, and one of the main roles of that organization is to advocate on our behalf on, on, um, on reducing or um, minimizing rate increases on the San Francisco side, or at least making sure the justification is there for any increases that come forward. So they really are advocating um, on that side. And on the Valley Water side, we work um, uh, with their staff very closely, um, almost weekly on a range of topics. And we uh, provide a comment um, throughout their rate making process uh, to reduce, uh, minimize, or pull back on, on the pace of increases. And, and what, what uh, some of our comments this year and, and come and mimic by some of the other cities um, water managers uh, in Santa Clara County is um, really is a concern as we're looking at the next six years and, and wholesale rates doubling that it's not sustainable. Um, and they, they have doubled. A lot of my customers when we talk to them in District 8 will we'll go back and, and, and talk about how, how, how much rates have increased and they have. Um, but it's, um, we're moving in a direction of doubling in six years wholesale side and potentially doubling again seven to eight years after that, that'd be a 400% increase. And so really what we are now is, is, is there a different form of collecting revenue? Is there bonds, property tax? I know it shifts the cost to a different, but, but it'll break us away from, from a higher cost based on declining water sales, which is where we're stuck in that dichotomy right now. Um, perhaps there's a different way that Valley Water can collect revenue as a property tax or um, perhaps, and this is not simple or easy, perhaps there could be a charter change for them uh, where they could do two different tiers of water, one uh, health and safety, like a lower, a lower amount, and then a, and a higher usage, higher amount, and then we could pass that subsidized rate or lower health and safety rate on to our customers. Um, and, and a few others that we um, are working with them on strategies of reducing uh, their costs. They, they are right now, though, just beginning the, the beginning stages of their capital improvement program, Anderson Dam's offline, and uh, that's a relatively expensive project. But, um, and then the other side too is, is what projects can they do? If water sales are declining, perhaps we don't need some of the more expensive projects now. They can be held off or pushed off in the out years. And so that conversation on cost management um, and timing is something that we do also throughout the year. Great, thank you. I, I, I know I'm, I'm certainly um, confident in my, in, in my ability to portray, you know, the, 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 the impact this would have on, on my residents and, and the district that I live in, and I'm sure Councilmember uh, Cohen would, would be more than happy to help articulate our, our position. Um, you know, I, I do sit on the Valley Water Commission or the Santa Clara, Clara Valley Water Commission, and I did uh, explain, you know, the, the cost increase, because they originally had a higher, a higher rate, but based on the lack of emergency water supplies that they had to acquire, which are way more costly, which we all know. Um, they, they've lowered it, but the, the lowering went from 15 to 14 and a half. So uh, that was <laughs> something that, you know, I, I, I fought for, and, and, and that's something that I, I think we have to be mindful of and, and count on, on not just myself, but I'm sure some colleagues would be more than happy to, uh, aside from our participation in Bosca, um, engaging directly with folks at the SFPUC as well as Valley Water. 
um, to, to see what we can do to, to make sure that we're relaying and, and advocating for our, for, for our residents because you're right, doubling our water rates and you know <laughs> is, is tough and, and that's just another burden uh, that makes affordability in our region that much more difficult. Um, that being said, I'll yield the five and a half minutes I have left. Thank you, council member. Agreed, and um, I think we all we all agree. We've had quite a few conversations about the impacts of these costs in recent years. It is definitely concerning. Um, appreciate your advocacy there. I don't see another hand, so I think we're ready to vote. I'm sorry. Did we have a motion? I don't think I've heard one yet. Okay, great. We have a. Motion a second. I now see a hand. Councilor Dwan. Thank you, Mayor. I just got a quick question. What pressure can can the city put on the Valley Water to remove restriction, which artificially inflate the cost? Can anyone answer that? Uh, you know, one thing I'll just note. I, I don't think I'm. <laughs> the right person to answer your question, but we did do a pretty comprehensive hearing, made a council hearing, and had Valley Water join us, I think actually a couple times in the last two years, and so we can certainly dig up those recordings, and I see Lee nodding, maybe the city manager's office can help us find those hearings and share them with the whole council for folks who want to watch the inquiry. Those of us on the council at the time had the opportunity to ask a lot of questions and get an in-depth presentation of how what goes into rates, uh, but I, I don't think we have any any direct authority, if that's your question. I don't know, Lee, if you want to add anything to that. No, that is correct. We don't have any direct authority, but we could certainly get those staff reports from the joint meetings, uh, Jeff and team, and share those with the full council. Would also just remind uh, council's given staff direction to work with Valley Water on the water purific purification project, which could uh, lead to potentially vastly lower uh, um, amounts than what we're paying for water in the future. So I think we're pursuing multiple avenues to, to take a look at this, but we can certainly share the minutes and, and staff reports uh, with this council um, from those previous joint meetings. Yeah, I just think that we, we, we're sending a, a wrong message to our constituent that they do their part to re reduce the consumption, the lowest usage, and then they get penalized for it, in a sense. Um, hopefully we can find um, a different solution um, to this, because it seems unfair that the water wholesaler can reduce the perceived supply through drought restriction, and then uh, to increase the demand and therefore increase cost. Um, and I, I just have concerns over, over that. That, that's all I have. Thanks, council member. Um, okay, appreciate everybody's comments and questions. Let's vote. <laughs> Made it. All right. Mo motion passes nine to two with Doan and Candelas voting no. Okay, thank you. All right, we're on to item 8.1, which is a public hearing on the Japantown Business Improvement District budget and assessments for the coming fiscal year. Items number one, uh, 8.1, 8.2 are public hearings for the approval of, well, in this case, item 8.1 is a public hearing for the approval of the Japantown Business Improvement District's annual budget reports and the levy of assessments for fiscal year 2023 to 2024. Before I open the public hearings, has the clerk received any written protests from affected businesses in this business improvement district? No written protests have been received from this business improvement district. Okay, thank you. At this time, we'll open the public hearing. We have public testimony on the Japantown Business Improvement District budget report and levy of assessments for 23-24. I have no cards and no hands up online. Oh, I'm oh, seeing a sorry. card come in as we speak. Blair? Hey, Blair. And this is, Blair, Town. this is for protests of the business improvement district, just to clarify. Protests? Go ahead. Uh, not just public comment? 
There's a public hearing on the proposed assessments to the Japantown Business Improvement District, yeah. to the property owners. Hi, uh, Blair Beekman. I just thought it would be time to offer one of my regular public comments that uh, for this project uh, for 24, fiscal year 23 and 24, uh, as we move into 24, it's my hope that we have uh, good hopes for, for 2024, that the stuff we do in this year can, uh, something's hopeful by 24 and 25, C good community projects, people working together well, and uh, understanding each other well. Good luck on those efforts, uh, again, as I try to say. And uh, I'm hopeful in what we can really expect in 24 and 25. Thanks a lot. Paul? Uh, yes, Paul for the Horseshoe. Uh, I'd like to, on December 7th of last year, on the uh, Historic Landmarks Commission, they had received the home of Norman Manetta as a part of the historical resources inventory for the city of San Jose. This was important. I felt so honored and so privileged as a citizen of San Jose to be at that meeting because what it showed and it demonstrated because- Paul, is this regarding the Japantown Business Improvement that, District? If you give me my time. I have two minutes. Let me finish my thought. Don't interrupt me. Now, may I continue? Thank you. Norman Mineta is the reason why this, this, the Japanese town and the Japanese area of San Jose is so important to critic, to, to establish and to give it its historical significance and to build it up because Norman Mineta was processed through the San Jose State University's gym. Then he went on to graduate from Stanford Law, and then he became who he became. But the start point was right there. For Norman Mineta, the womb was Japantown. And this is critically important. When you're talking about building up and investing in particular areas, it is critically important to talk about the history of these areas. And the men and the women who created that history, that is critically important. And this is why it's such an insult to me as a citizen, as a historian, and as a researcher to interrupt me in these types of meetings and try to act like I don't know. Back to the council. Thank you. Okay, we will now close the public hearing. Since the business owners in the Japantown Business Improvement District have supported the proposed levy of assessments, I will now ask the council to consider adoption of the resolutions and approval of the ordinances approving the budget reports of the Japantown Business Improvement Districts for fiscal year 2023 to 2024 and levying assessments in the business improvement district for fiscal year 2023 to 2024. I will now entertain a motion. So moved. Second. Thank you. And I do not see any hands, so let's vote. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. We are on to item 8.2, which is the public hearing on the downtown business improvement district budget report and assessments for fiscal year 2023-2024. Before I open the public hearings, has the clerk received any written protests from affected businesses in this business improvement district? No written protests have been received from the downtown business improvement district. Thank you. At this time, we'll open the public hearing. Blair? Hi, Blair Beekman. Um, there was a few, there's a, a couple items that talk about downtown in the past six months. Uh, one of them was about uh, converting a, one of the old major hotels, I think the Hilton, into a more of a residential hotel uh, purpose and uh, a lot of questions around that. It brought up to my mind the, the, the work of the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce that may I think be able to infuse some kind of interesting ideas for downtown projects uh, in the coming year, in the coming few years. Good luck in those sort of efforts and consideration. And um, I, I wanted to offer a quick thought. Uh, I hope that uh, as you're budgeting for each for districts uh, each year that we are considering equity more and finding a, a, a pot of equity ideas that everyone can agree on and then from there specialty items can appear and uh, 
I'm trying to learn how to better talk about that, but I think that's something you're trying to learn at the end of the previous uh, mayoral administration that I hope you're uh, learning to work on at this time. Thanks. Paul? Uh, yes, Paul Sokol from the Horseshoe. I don't have a whole lot of faith in building up downtown's district, and here's why. The dude that you have now as the president of the Downtown Association, this dude came in and said, you know what, I'm gonna make downtown look like Beverly Hills. Really, really. There's a responsibility that you have as council members, as you represent me. So as a, re as a representative of me, you have a responsibility to uh, take an accounting that if you build in a structure like that and you keep investing in something like that, there's naturally gonna be a consequence to other classes of people. That man, as Mexicanos and Chicanos, we haven't even had a chance to breathe, man. We have never had the opportunity to build ourselves a floor and then build up from that because the Gabacho keeps coming in and pulling the rug out from under us. So you have to assume a responsibility when you are centering investment downtown that is necessarily going to exclude certain classes of people and then to look to, to sit there on this dice and then look at me and 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 act like oh well, well what's he talking about oh this guy's crazy i ain't crazy i just know what you know and i'm not going to sit here as a as a as a as a lifelong citizen of this city and also the people i'm a part of the people that have experienced the generational consequences of the deficits and the neglect that came right out of this council's votes. So I have a responsibility to my community to ensure that you don't keep harming us by creating policies that is going to necessarily exclude. Do you, do you, do you hear what I'm saying? It's going to necessarily exclude. And then the, the, the ultimate fallacy is to have a Mexican do it. You have two Mexicans that are in charge. You have... You have Councilman Torres standing there acting like he's going to protect our community. Tony, thank you. Okay, thank you. We'll now close the public hearing. Since the business owners in the downtown business improvement district have supported the proposed levy of assessments, I will now ask the council to consider adoption of the resolutions and approval of the ordinances approving the budget reports of the downtown business improvement districts for fiscal year 2023 to 2024 and levying assessments in the Business Improvement District for fiscal year 2023 to 2024. So moved. Second. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Cohen? Oh, that was, okay, we are voting. There it is. Motion passes unanimously. Great, thank you very much. Uh, we're on to land use consent Starting with item 10.1A, which has to do with rezoning a number of parcels to be aligned with the general plan in response to Senate Bill 1333. There is no staff presentation. Well, both are on consent A and B, so it's all one item. Oh, consent. you can take them together. Okay. We will take the consent calendar together. Is there a motion? Second. Public comment? I have Manuel Trigos. We're going to take the items together, so yeah. feel free to talk on 10, uh, 10 1 B. So together, so go ahead. Hello, my name is Manuel Trigos, uh, the landowner of that property there. And, uh, East Foothills. Um, I was just here, uh, wanted to be present. I know there was about six individuals who wanted to uh, contest against the uh, proposal. And I just wanted to say that it's a two acre parcel. We're planning on putting one single family residence on that property with an ADU. Um, I don't think there should be any harm to the area. Um, and uh, hopefully you guys will give it consideration. Thank you. Roxanne. It breaks my heart to listen to all of your conversations up here today because now you're going to take an option 
that's going to make all your words false. For 15 years, I've tried to take my property that I'm the owner, I was a general contractor for 20 years, and I'm willing to be the developer to provide housing to my community. And there's not one council member up here and not one staff of your council that's been willing to work towards providing that housing. And now you're gonna take that unit and rezone it and basically make that project unavailable. So you're going in the opposite direction. My property is zoned light industrial. They're putting up five and six story buildings there. And now you're gonna turn it into housing, which I'm not opposed to housing, but I wanted to make a resource center for my community where I could have training, maybe a little cafe, little um, brewery, so that my community could learn job skills. Because we have 100% unemployment in my community, and none of you hire trans women. City of San Jose has never, ever hired a trans woman. Shame on you. And now you're gonna take action to prevent us from getting housing and prevent us from getting job employment skills. That's why I say it's all a big farce because I've been trying to work with the city for 15 years to bring that into fruition and get silenced and kicked to the curb. Paul. Sorry, Paul, that's my fault. Paul, something from the horseshoe. Uh, I, I, let me reiterate what I just heard so that I understand it correctly. A person is going to have a single family home with an ADU and he needs two acres of land to do it. And you guys are gonna disapprove it. And I'll bet you the vote's gonna be unanimous. In the next sentence, you guys will also start preaching to us what we need to do downtown and how we need to get rid of our cars and how we need to be packed like sardines downtown. I mean, this is, I mean, do you, can you guys really like look at yourself and make an honest assessment of yourself and say, hey, there is absolutely no contradiction or hypocrisy in that. Now, I know that you can't. And you know that you can't. The problem is, is that you do it, and then you do it week after week after week. You do it so often that it really, like, like well, shoot the shit. It becomes normalized. Look, land use, land use issues right now is at a very critical point. Why? Because generationally, land was taken over, and there was no democratic process. The Chicano and the Mexicano community were deprived of participating in that process because the land use issues were all racially motivated. Give the Gabacho all of it and give the Mexicano none of it. That was the policy. And now when you have a chance, an opportunity to start reassessing that logic and reason and then start inserting the Mexicano and Chicano perspective and the generational impacts that that deficit is created, you're gonna like, just like look at someone like me and like, eh, what's he talking about? You know what I'm talking about. And these land use issues need to be amended. We need to start talking about taxing Willow Glen and putting a tax on their equity to amend that historical deficit. Back to the council. Thank you. Councilman Ortiz. Thank you. Just, um, I don't know if we have any staff oh. present who could answer a question on this or? Oh, I see Chris up there. Another hand did just go up. Um, Sylvan. Okay. Uh, Councilor, do you mind if we take one yeah, more? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, Sorry. we'll take one last comment. Go ahead. Sylvan, Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, my name is Abhishek. I'm, um, I'm kind of speaking on behalf of small businesses and their customers who are going to be impacted by this decision. I'm myself a small business owner and 
Um, of course, I'm, you know, I'll be impacted by at least one of the zoning decisions uh, on Camden Avenue in San Jose. But I know many small business owners who are going to be impacted by this. This is, if, you know, the zoning is changed in my case, you know, from, I believe, commercial to residential. Um, I, I understand the need for housing. I'm totally supportive of it. Uh, but, but I know my customers, I know my fellow small business owners who are just going to lose our livelihoods. You know, this change goes through and then there's redevelopment on, on, you know, on our properties. I mean, landlords will be fine, but the tenants and the businesses will be severely, severely impacted. And you know, I'm going to lose literally my livelihood. I need to figure out something else to do if this goes through and, you know, my business essentially gets wiped off the map uh, in the area that that's going to get impacted. So I would like you to kind of think about that as well as, as you kind of make, make these decisions. Okay, back to the council. Thank you, Councilor Ortiz. Thank you, Mayor. Um, how's it going, everyone? <laughs> I just, quick question, obviously we heard um, some comments uh, during public comment, and I thought this was kind of like a fairly straightforward rezoning that just made us aligned with the general plan. Does, will this rezoning impact, I think one individual mentioned they wanted to provide like a, a service center for their, their community. Another gentleman, um, a, a person on the call mentioned it would stop, impact their business. I just wanna, is this confusion? Is this accurate? I just wanna make sure. So uh, thanks council member, Chris Burton, Director of Planning, Building Code Enforcement. Um, there's a, a number of different pieces going on in okay. there. But essentially, so this is part of the ongoing process to align uh, with uh, State Senate Bill 1333 that requires us as a charter city to have alignment between our general plan and our zoning. So in the past, um, we haven't had that requirement as a charter city. And where we've gone through and made significant changes in the general plan, we've assumed change over time because our general plan is looking forwards. Um, whereas the zoning district is kind of looking at the existing condition and the parameters for use and development within a property. So it kind of looks backwards into the current condition. And so this really kind of brings that alignment to the both. So, so in those couple of different instances, there's a couple of different pieces going on. So for anybody that's an existing business that occupies those spaces, um, those uses are considered, once we change the zoning, legal non-conforming. So they're allowed to continue those uses on an ongoing basis in perpetuity. Um, should that use end, so I mean, you know, one of the examples we've had recent conversations with um, something like vehicle repair, which there's actually quite a considerable amount of demand for because there's a limit of light industrial space. So should a, light, uh, a vehicle repair business go out of business in that light industrial zoning district after it's been changed, um, another user can come in within a six month process and, and re-up under that same provision of illegal non-conforming use. So, so there's a, an ability to continue the uses on the land, uh, but really what we're looking for is that opportunity as uh, the area changes over time to bring it into conformance with the general plan. And so, so that's the change that's going on. With, um, with the adult care use, I know staff, my staff has been in touch with that um, property owner. So we're, we're looking at opportunities to help facilitate that. My understanding of that situation is that um, there is an ability for that use to occur in the, uh, in the new zoning district. We just need to make sure that we have the right definition and the right understanding of what that Are, are you referring is. to Roxanne? Yes, who was just yeah, yeah. So you have been communicating with her? Yes, uh, I believe uh, Council District 3 staff connected uh, that member of the public with uh, my staff, and so there's an ongoing communication okay, as of today. I heard that nobody was working with her, so I was like, okay. Yeah, so understood. there could still be a possibility that they could do what they would like to do. Yeah. Okay, yeah. all right, um, and then in, in regards to this, like, good, good to hear that you've already connected with Roxanne, but for all the other businesses, have they been engaged, or is this the first time there's been a community meeting about this, or? So with, with 1333 rezonings, um, we've, had a, we've done a lot of work around the noticing because obviously it's a considerable amount of properties. Um, generally, we haven't been doing a lot of proactive community meetings. We've done broader sort of citywide, but not gone area by area, just because really this is alignment with that ongoing general plan process. But, um, but you know, as we've improved the outreach and the mailers on that, we have been getting more questions from the public. And obviously, uh, we're working with them to help them understand the situation of any particular use. Okay. One final question. I think this is just a confirmation of what you already said, but if, for example, uh, a restaurant is one of these properties, if they're already a restaurant, they can continue to do that. If there's a coffee shop, they can continue to be a coffee shop. If there's a contractor yard or service yard, they can continue to have their trucks and stuff like that and in their yard. It's just 
once the property transfers owners or in the future, that's when, when it would change. Yeah, and, and even then, right? So if the six business months, closes, yeah. but, and, and even beyond the six months, there is a special use permit process that can actually sort of reinstate a legal mm -hmm. non-conforming use. So there's a number of opportunities for us to continue, even if a business closed and another business was looking to utilize the site. Okay. Yeah, I could, I could understand how property owners could be confused and maybe upset, but I appreciate you answering my questions and hopefully um, uh, any other questions that may arise through, through email or phone calls. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Ortiz. Uh, Councilmember Torres? No, I, I just wanted to thank uh, planning for, for helping us out with that. Um, Roxana literally lives in one of the most mixed zoned areas in Spartan Keys. And as we, you know, as we know, Spartan Keys uh, has seen a, a huge change uh, in the past, you know, three decades. And so I thank you for making sure that uh, she's connected and that her concerns are being addressed. So thank you. Great. I don't see any of other uh, council members on. Uh, there's a motion and a second to take uh, both items A and B together. All the, oh, I guess going to Tony. Councilmember Batra. Motion passes unanimously. Great, thanks everybody. Thank you, Vice Mayor. We are on to open forum. This is an opportunity for any members of the public who wish to speak on city business that was not on today's agenda to do so. Do we have any speakers? I have Debbie and Blair here in person. So again, that's Debbie and Blair. Hi everyone, um, my name is Debbie DeGudis. I am the managing director of Christmas in the Park. I work for Santa, I have a great job. Um, Christmas in the Park runs for 40 days and we have more than 750,000 visitors. We're the largest event in San Jose and we've been bringing vibrancy downtown for more than 40 years. And unpermitted, unpermitted vendors are impacting us financially right now. Winter Wonderland and Butler Amusements run the games and rides in downtown San Jose during Christmas in the Park. Because of the unpermitted vendors, they are not returning. Butler places rides in our park and they give us a rev share of $55,000. That's a huge impact for a nonprofit. Downtown, downtown ice, ice cannot find a producer for the ice rink. So for downtown businesses, that means kind of a quiet downtown during Christmas. Um, here's the thing, the lack of code enforcement threatens the viability of Christmas in the park. Few will miss the unpermitted vendors, residents will miss the rides and the ice skating. So please consider the optics of unhappy families, consider the optics of struggling businesses, and consider the optics of a really quiet downtown this holiday season. These are the optics we ask you to pay attention to. You can no longer ignore the unpermitted vendors in downtown. Thank you. Thank you, next speaker. Hi, Blair Beekman, uh, to kind of uh, offer what I tried to offer at public comment uh, transportation and environment committee yesterday. Uh, around ARPA issues, uh, very much of a thank you that you actually had a, a public meeting uh, on it a few weeks ago now, a week and a half ago now, a week ago. <laughs> um, boy, well, you did have a public meeting and it was just a really nice thing to do because you described you're gonna put ARPA funding in police budgeting that I found um, we've got so many other ways to make choices with that sort of funding that uh, I, to, to give it a, a public meeting process at this budget time can give us a few more months to really figure out different solutions that I think uh, a police budgeting, putting it in police budgeting is condoning the concepts of war, the prison military industrial complex uh, we can invest our money in so many more different good ways that, you know, we can be creative 
and and I hope the whole part of the public meeting process was to ask what that creativity can be, because I think we can find it. I don't think it should be too hard. Living wage issues, people work on those things all the time. We can work on a, on a good progressive budget, and, and good luck in those efforts to do that with this ARPA money. I wanted to also mention about Measure E issues, that interestingly, with the, uh, there was an item today about the Pacific Hotel that I was corrected on. It had a really deep uh, item that was going around Measure E issues that um, we can't be afraid of middle income ideas and that market rate housing isn't the answer for everything and that we can trust middle income and affordable housing ideas as ways to really address um, our issues. And I think there's a fear in that and I hope that we can learn to get over that and all the work you'll be doing. Thank you that you're trying to mediate. Uh, go for the 7525 Thank if you can, thanks. Thomas, followed by Colin User 2. Thank you. Thomas Knight, a member of the Lived Experience Advisory Board of Silicon Valley, Mayor Mahan, and City Council. I am personally disheartened here of the planned stay of a City Council member at an interim housing site set amidst press coverage and public fanfare and after turning down a congregate shelter stay. This approach does not reflect the lived experience of homeless individuals in this city. There is little doubt that the service provider will ensure the unit is in pristine condition, fully operational and clean for his brief stay. However, this orchestrated event in no way represents the reality of those who live or have lived through the devastating challenges of homelessness. It is critical to remember that these are not simply housing units or statistics, these are people's lives. I implore you, please do not trivialize their misfortune and struggle by turning it into a publicity event and thereby taking a bed away from someone who truly needs it, if only, even, even if only for a night. Furthermore, I, during one of the last city council meetings, the conduct of most council members during the open forum was appalling standing and engaging in private conversations while the public was expressing concerns was not just disrespectful, but it was unprofessional and unethical. We need our elected officials to truly listen, to understand and to make, and to take to heart the voice concerns of their constituents, especially when they pertain to the most vulnerable citizens. Thank you for your time. Colin user two, followed by Paul. Yes, hi, Martha O'Connell, GSMOL. With, with great respect, I ask the city clerk to please check the dashboard. I had my hand up. I was on the telephone. I, I was not called on. I've been sending emails saying I've got my hand up, sent one to uh, Sergio and Pam during the meeting. Uh, please check your, your dashboard uh, a little bit more carefully. And just as a reminder to the council members, once upon a time, the trash, the water, all of these things were included in the rent for mobile home residents. All of those items are now what are called line items and are separate from the rent. They're no longer included. So the, these increases are very, very critical for, for mobile home residents. It's pricing us out of a place to live. Thank you. Paul? That's Paul Soto from the horse. I'm, I'm going to assume, I'm really going to assume that I didn't hear or I didn't read the report correctly because what I, what I read is that the police officer does not consider pulling his weapon and pointing it at a human being as force. I really hope I read that wrong because what this means is is that that person doesn't necessarily should never be a police officer. Why? Because it means that he cannot assess what is dangerous and what is not. This is the kind of this is the, the this is the dichotomy that the city put itself in. Because if a police officer cannot assess that him pointing a weapon with a loaded round is not force, he does not belong as a police officer. He needs to turn in his badge because the man is dangerous. He is dangerous. 
Because what you're saying is, if I got a gun and I put it in my hand and I pointed it at an officer, what you're saying, using that logic, that I am not dangerous. This is what you're saying. Secondly, whenever an officer rationalizes and justifies his pointing his weapon and firing, Anthony Nunes and Jacob Dominguez, cases in point, these men didn't even have a weapon, and they blasted them, citizens of my community. And these cops are going to, hey, you, I'm serious, man, do not do this. Because what you're saying is that a cop can use that kind of force against a citizen with impunity, and you guys will protect it. What is the citizenry supposed to do when the police officers are the very things that we as a community need for? Okay, I have, um, I'm not, I think it says Guru Surrender Dollywall, and that's in person. Hi, Mayor, Council. Um, I think some of you already know who I am. Um, so just to, briefly, I was raised in San Jose. I've been a part of the Sikh community my whole life. My family helped build the San Jose Gurdwara. And uh, now I work there full time. I quit my job at Google to serve. Um, but I'm living in a mental health nightmare with diagnoses of bipolar, schizophrenia, ADHD, all of which I don't have. And I've proven I don't have it to my community, but yours doesn't seem to understand because you're not Sikh. I've reached the highest level of enlightenment, which is called Sachkhand. It's uh, where truth is. And there's no one above that. And I would like my son back. I haven't seen him since May 6, 2022. Since 2019, when doctors tried to kill me, I've lost over 500 days of time with my child for no reason except that. I choose to be a Sikh and follow Guru Nanak, and other people don't quite understand that. And it's not a mental illness. I've been working on conquering my mind, and I've already done that. And now I teach other people how to, and help others reach enlightenment as well. And I would like all of you to do something to get me my son back in my arms where he belongs. Thank you. Back to council. Thank you, Tony. We are adjourned. Thank you all.